As our tale begins, the respectable Mr. Scott Eccles is met at a Surrey train station by his recent acquaintance and fellow cartography enthusiast, Mr. Aloysius Garcia, who escorts him by cab to a countryside residence. But upon arrival, Mr. Scott Eccles is confronted with an old tumble-down building, eerily grass-grown and in disrepair. Becoming increasingly unsure of his host and their surroundings, Mr. Eccles reluctantly proceeds, thus beginning the adventure of Wisteria Lodge. On Baker Street, Holmes and Watson smoke, and the great detective ruminates over a recently received telegram. I suppose, Watson, we must look upon you as a man of letters. How do you define the word grotesque? Grotesque? Oh, strange? Remarkable? No, 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 no. Surely there's more to it than that. Some underlying suggestion of a tragic, a terrible. If you cast your mind back to those narratives with which you've inflicted a long suffering public, you will see how often the word grotesque has deepened into the criminal. Ah, I suppose the affair of the red headed men was grotesque enough at the outset. Huh? Ah! Oh, that most grotesque affair. The five orange pips. Yes, which led straight to a murderous conspiracy. Another word puts me on the alert. Oh, how about you there? Hmm. I've just had the most incredible and grotesque experience. May I consult you, Scott Eccles? Post office, Charing Cross. Oh, a man or a woman? A oh, man! No woman would send a reply paid telegram, she would have come. Did you see him? Oh, my dear Watson. You know how bored I've been since we locked up Colonel Carruthers. Life is commonplace. The newspapers are sterile. Audacity and man seem to have passed forever from the criminal world. Of course I'll see him. But as I'm very much mistaken, this is our client. With the addition of some reflective flair from director Peter Hammond, this scene is a near identical adaptation of the Conan Doyle original. And in his book, Granada's Greatest Detective, author Keith Frankel aptly sings its praises. The discourse of Wisteria Lodge is amongst Doyle's very finest. And, gratifyingly, a generous sample finds its way into Jeremy Paul's prose. Our protagonist's musings on the precise definition of the word grotesque sets a pensively powerful tone but it's conversation alluding to matters beyond the canonical periphery of the series that fascinates most of all. Not only does Watson make reference to an unseen affair involving five orange pips, but Holmes himself laments the recent incarceration of one Colonel Carruthers, evidently a once indomitable figure upon his horizon, perhaps even belonging to the Moriarty-Milverton breed. It's a titillating reminder that when it comes to the life and times of Sherlock Holmes, we are only ever seeing glimpses of a much larger picture. Mr. Holmes. Thank you, Mrs. Hudson. Well, are you, Mr. Holmes? Certainly. Yes, Mr. Holmes, I have just had a most singular and unpleasant experience. Really? Yes, never in my life have I been subject to, uh, to, uh, to such embarrassment and been placed in such a position. Please sit down, Mrs. Scott Eggles, my friend and colleague, Dr. Watson, now in the first place, may I ask? Why you have come to me at all? Oh, oh, well, sir, uh, it didn't appear to be a matter which concerned the police. Yet, when you've heard the facts, you must admit I, I couldn't just leave it where it was. Now, private detectives, they are a class with whom I'm absolutely, I have no sympathy. Sit! <coughs> Mr. Scott Eccles. Well, y y y nonetheless, uh, having heard your name, right, I sir. decided... Mm. Now, in the second place, why did you not come to me at once? What do you mean? Well, it is now a quarter past two. The telegram is dispatched about one. No one could glance at your toilet in a tower without seeing that your disturbance dates from the moment of your waking. What? Uh, you're right, Mr. Holmes. Yes, I never gave a thought to my toilet. I, I was only too glad to get out of such a house. You, you see, 
I've been running round making inquiries before I, I came here. See, I, I called at the house agents, you know. Oh, yes, yes. And, and they said, they said that, that Mr. Garcia's rent was paid up all right and that <laughs> everything was in order in Wisteria Lodge. Oh, no, come, 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 sir. <laughs> you know, you're like my friend Watson who has the bad habit of telling his stories wrong end foremost. Now, please, please, arrange your thoughts and let me know in their due sequence, exactly what those events are, which have sent you out, unbrushed and unkempt, with your dress boots and waistcoat buttoned awry, in search of advice and assistance. Mr. Eccles collects himself and explains that, as a sociable bachelor, he cultivates a large number of friends, including a recent acquaintance by the name of Garcia who invited him to spend an evening at Wisteria Lodge, his Surrey home. But conversation around their shared love of maps soon deteriorated when their dinner was interrupted by the arrival of a message. A message which his host quickly read and then threw into the fire with noticeable emotion. And he made no remark as to the contents of the note? None. But from that moment, he gave up all pretense of conversation. He just sat there, smoking these endless cigarettes. About 11, I was glad to get to bed. Two hours later, he looked in at my door. Uh, did you ring? Did I ring? Ah, oh, please, don't wake up. It's nearly one o'clock. Please go back to sleep. Good night. And now I come to the amazing part of my tale. <laughs> when I woke, it was broad daylight. Nearly nine. I had particularly asked to be called at eight. So I was very much astonished at this forgetfulness. I I rang for the servant. There was no response. I went from room to room. All were deserted. Even my host's room. The bed had never been slept in. Foreign host, foreign footman, foreign cook, all vanished in the night. Your experience is, so far as I know, perfectly unique. Together, Holmes, Watson, and Mr. Scott Eccles set out for Wisteria Lodge. The respectable John Scott Eccles was played here by British actor Donald Churchill. Born in Southall, Middlesex, on November 6, 1930, Churchill was the son of an engine driver on the old Great Western Railway. He dropped out of school at age 14 and bounced between a number of different jobs, from judicial office assistant to junior reporter on the Dartmouth Chronicle. He spent his national service in the army, and upon leaving, joined the ROC players in Yeovil, Somerset, which is where his life as an actor began. He entered films and television in 1956, making appearances in shows like The Saint and Zed Cars, and later playing leads in Spooner's Patch and Bulldog Breed. But in the 1960s, he decided to also try his hand at writing and successfully pitched his first television miniseries to the BBC. Churchill would spend the rest of his life successfully combining the two careers and racking up over 83 performance credits and more than 35 screenplay credits, which included hits like Moody and Peg and the war film Zeppelin. He even took a turn as the good doctor himself when he played Watson to Ian Richardson's Holmes in the 1983 Mapleton Films production of Hound of the Baskervilles. What of our visitor's stick? Well, uh, I, I would say that he is a country doctor who does a great deal of his visiting on foot. Good, excellent. Why so? Well, because no respectable town physician would be seen carrying such a battered stick. And the visiting on foot? Ah, uh, well, you see, this thick iron ferrule here is worn down. Perfectly sound. Anything else? Well, I mean, I, I would suggest that the inscription from the Friends of CCH uh, stands for something Hunt, which leads me to think that Dr Mortimer is an athletic man, you know, sort of sporting type. Really, Watson, you excel yourself. Oh, oh thank you. Uh, anything escaped me? Almost everything, I'm afraid. His final role was that of irascible Harbourmaster Metcalf in the Granada series LCID. Sadly, on October 29, 1991, after filming his final episode of that series, Donald Churchill suffered a fatal heart attack. This fine actor 
was 60 years old. At Wisteria Lodge, the trio find the property much as Mr. Eccles had described it, but they are soon confronted by a colorful local inspector. Mr. Holmes. Welcome to Wisteria Lodge, Mr. Holmes. Inspector Baines of the Surrey Constabulary. <laughs> this is uh, Constable Downing. <laughs> and you are Mr. John Scott Eccles of Popham House Lee. I am. <laughs> Mr. Scott Eccles, we've been following you about all the morning. You traced him through his telegram, I presume. Exactly, Mr. Holmes. We picked up the scent at Charing Cross Post Office. But what do you want? Uh, why do you follow me? Oh, we wish a statement, Mr. Scott Eccles, as to the events which led up to the death of Mr. Aloysius Garcia of Wisteria Lodge, near Isha. Dead, did you say? Oh, yes, he is dead, yes. Uh, but how? An accident? A uh, murder, sir. If ever there was one on Earth. While executive producer Michael Cox was a fan of actor Freddie Jones, he was somewhat uncertain of his performance here. And in his book, A Study in Celluloid, he explained. Now, what is one to say about Freddie Jones's performance as the inspector? He certainly gives us the vain, ambitious character described by Conan Doyle. He embroiders it with a few actor's tricks, the mittens, the outrageous hat, and the boiled sweets, and sits up and begs for words like rich and ripe to be applied to it. I would describe it as smug. It is certainly such a big performance that it nearly throws the picture out of balance. It was not a piece of work which I admired. Well, perhaps Michael Cox was being a bit overly critical. Or perhaps not. But either way, let's take a moment to meet the actor behind the Surrey Constabulary's best. In the role of the capable Inspector Baines, we have Mr. Freddie Jones. Born Frederick Charles Jones in Stoke-on-Trent, Staffordshire, on the 12th of September, 1927, Freddie Jones's father was an electrical porcelain thrower and his mother played piano at the local pub. The family resided in a relatively poor part of town where, as Jones later reminisced, you could practically chew on the smoke from the kilns. After attending grammar school in Longton, he found work as a lab assistant at the headquarters of the British Ceramic Research Association where he attempted to specialize in the industrial chemistry of urinals and lavatories. He described this time in his life as driving him clinically insane. But in his late 20s, he met his very first girlfriend, and she introduced him to a local drama teacher, who, recognizing his latent talent, applied on his behalf to every drama college in the country. He was awarded a scholarship to Rose Bruford College, and his acting career began. His son, well-known actor Toby Jones, later stated, In a way, acting saved his life. He fell in love with the romance of acting, and suddenly he could express himself. He could key into that euphoria. After a period with the Lincoln Repertory Company, he decided to ply his trade in London, and he moved into a tiny house filled with aspiring actors and writers, including a young Tom Stoppard, whom he remembered staying up all night writing scripts for Mrs. Dale's diary. Jones made his first big splash on television as Claudius, in the six-part ITV series of The Caesars in 1968. Before filming, Jones kept a stone in his shoe for three months to help him perfect the character's limp. For his portrayal of the Roman Emperor, he was named the world's best television actor of the year at the 1969 Monte Carlo Television Festival. Jones went on to join the Royal Shakespeare Company, but he didn't relish his time there. He recalled, I was marked down, along with people like Tim West and John Nettleton, as a BCM, a bad company member. He soon left the RSC, never to return. But it was around this time, in 1980, when he took on his most famous stage role, 
that of Wolfit in Ronald Harwood's The Dresser, where he played an old ham who faces disaster in the mirror while preparing to play King Lear. It was this part that caught the attention of American film director David Lynch, who immediately cast Jones as Bites, the sadistic freak show proprietor who abducts the deformed John Merrick in 1980's The Elephant Man. The actor would participate in a wide array of memorable films over the years, including Crawl, Firestarter, Zulu Dawn, and Juggernaut, just to name a few of his 215 IMDb credits. He would even play the monster in Terence Fisher's Frankenstein Must Be Destroyed, which is considered by many to be one of Hammer's greatest films. Though his favorite screen role was Orlando, an intermittently drunk journalist in Federico Fellini's And the Ship Sails On. Quite an eclectic career. But Sherlockians will remember him most fondly for two roles, Baines in Wisteria Lodge, but also Chester Cragwich the troubled final victim of the Rametap death cult in the Barry Levinson classic, Young Sherlock Holmes. The boy who wrote the letter and his sister were staying in England with their grandfather when they learned of the destruction of the Egyptian village. Both their parents were killed in the attack. The boy vowed when he grew to manhood that the Rametap would take their revenge and replace the bodies of the five Egyptian princesses. And the boy was called Atar. Atar? Those were Wax Flatter's final words. Very good ones. Atar! <laughs> you filthy murderer. You wanted to kill all of us. Well, you won't kill me. Watson, speak to him. What? At a private event in 1991, Jeremy Brett was asked what he remembered about his experiences working with Freddie Jones on Wisteria Lodge, and he recalled the following. Freddie Jones. He's quite a character, isn't he? Yes. He, just before the take in the house, when I did that deduction, I ransacked that house. Yeah. Um, a naughty moment. Especially, <laughs> especially sitting on the floor. With yes, I know, with all the ash. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> that happens occasionally when I suddenly think the film needs a boost. Yeah. Um, and Freddie Jones was standing there eating sugar babies. <laughs> and, of course, some were green, some were orange, some were red. And so his tongue went on into green and red. <laughs> and I said, listen, before we do a shot, can you tell me which colour you're going to suck? <laughs> because otherwise I'm going to be thrown for a loop. And he said, and I said, perhaps, could I have one? He said, nope. <laughs> anyway, I can't remember which colour his tongue was on the tape, but I, I was ready for it anyway. Orange, she was orange. This is quite an event. He drinks black velvet, which is champagne and Guinness, and eats hardly at all. <laughs> And he used to say, I'm joining you for dinner. I said, lovely, Freddy, I'm lovely. And then he'd say, Tapster! <laughs> right across this hotel. His dinner was Guinness and Champagne. Mr. Jones would return to the Granada series a few years later in a small cameo, playing a colorful street peddler in The Last Vampire, a casting decision with which producer Michael Cox never quite came to terms but we'll come back to that in a future episode. In 2005, Jones assumed his final role when he joined the long-running soap Emmerdale as Sandy Thomas, the scapegrace father of the vicar, a character he unashamedly enjoyed in the twilight of his years. When interviewed, he was asked where he found his inspiration, and he replied, My life springs from my wife, my family, my work, and my whiskey. Freddie Jones left Emmerdale in 2018 at the age of 90 and passed away the following year after a brief illness on the 9th of July, 2019. After discovering that his note was found in the pocket of the dead man, Mr. Scott Eccles recounts his story to the inspector. I'm bound to say, Mr. Scott Eccles, that uh, everything you've said does agree with the facts as they've come to our notice. For example, the note 
that arrived during dinner. <laughs> Mrs. Scott Eggles, what became of the note? Uh, well, Garcia rolled it up and, and, and threw it in the fire. What do you say to that, Bay? It was a dog great, Mr. Holmes. He uh, overpitched it. <laughs> I uh, found this unburnt at the back. You must have made a very careful examination of the house to find a single pellet of paper. Oh, I did, Mr. Holmes, I did. <laughs> it's my way. <laughs> the note's written on ordinary uh, cream-laid paper with a watermark. It's a quarter sheet. The paper's cut off in two snips with the short-bladed scissors. It's been uh, folded twice and sealed with scarlet wax. It's addressed to Mr. Garcia, Wisteria Lodge. And it says, <clears throat> Our own colours, green and white. Green open, white shut. Main stairs, first corridor, seventh right. Green bays. God speed. D. <laughs> it's in a woman's writing, done with a very sharp pointed pen. But the address is either done with a different pen or by someone else, <laughs> because it's thicker and bolder, as you may see, Mr. Holmes. <laughs> it's a remarkable note. I really must congratulate you on your attention to detail. There are a few trifling points which might perhaps be added. The seal is a sleeve link. What else is of such a shave? The scissors were bent, nail scissors. Short as the two snips are, you can distinctly see the slight curve in each. <laughs> Thought I'd squeezed it dry, Mr. Holmes. But I see there was some still left over after all. <laughs> Baines goes on to explain that Mr. Garcia was found dead on Oxshot Common that morning, his head beaten to a pulp with no sign of robbery. A further inspection of the house revealed an antique flintlock dueling pistol, one of a pair, but its counterpart was missing. The scene here, depicting Holmes' rather messy examination of the sitting room, displayed Jeremy Brett's trademark Sherlockian eccentricities, tossing papers into the air, digging his hands in the fireplace ash, and more. But as singular as the performance that aired indeed was, it was originally even more eccentric, as we learned in a recent conversation with David Hansen, a member of the Granada team who went on to produce and direct many shows and films of his own. On Wisteria Lodge, he served as floor manager to Peter Hammond, and he was kind enough to share a few memories with us of his time on the show. Being on a Sherlock Holmes, I suddenly realized, was like being at a party at Jeremy's. <laughs> it was his party. Yeah. And Jeremy was absolutely flying during this episode. He was uh, on top form. He wasn't very well, but um, he was making up for that in spades by being rising to Peter Hammond's kind of theatrical throwing down of a gauntlet. You know, Peter, Peter said, I'm going to do it in this way. And Jeremy really, really rose to it. And it's the scene where Holmes is in the kind of dining living room of, of Wisteria Lodge. Uh, and, you know, we rolled, we rolled film and uh, called action. And Jeremy went over to the fire grate where the ashes were, shoveled them in his hands into the ashes and threw them into his own face and up into the air, <laughs> filling the room with ash. Uh, he, he got over to the guitar, flipped it off its stand so it landed on the floor. He got onto the sheet music and just scattered it up in the air. <laughs> and so the room was filled with sheet music, a guitar bouncing off the floor, <laughs> and ash. And um, we, none of us knew what to do. I looked at the, the, the operator, Doug Hallows, and he, he took his eye off the eyepiece to look at me as if to say, what was that about? And when the dust was settling, and Peter Hammond was so circumspect, <laughs> and uh, he said, well, we, we need to clear the room, clearly, to reset, because it was just a mess. He couldn't have filmed anything else in it. And he took Jeremy to one side, and Jeremy just had these eyes blinking out of all this soot on his face. Uh, and he said, how was it, darling? How was it? And Peter said, well, 
I think, you know, we maybe need to do it again, Jeremy. We maybe need to do it again. And the designer came in, Tim Welding, and David Round, who did all the prop buying for Sherlock, came in. And he said to me afterwards, I couldn't believe it. He said, do you know how much that guitar was to hire? Do you know how much that music was to hire? <laughs> he said, you can't let him do that again. And so when you see the the second version, it took us like an hour to clean the set, when you see and to clean Jeremy. And when you see the second second take, he has really calmed down. He just touches the ash. He touches the guitar. And Watson, you'll note, gets his hands on his very, very quickly. Yeah. And takes it off him as a prop. <laughs> and I remember thinking, oh, my word, this is like, you know, I'd never seen anything like that from an actor in that set. But he was so into that character. I mean, you know, you'll know this yourself. And he just rose to the theatricality of the situation. As the others make a brief inspection of the house, Dr. Watson examines the pistol in closer detail, when suddenly his eye spies a graven, intimidating face leering at the window. As Watson cries aloud for help, the man takes off running across the yard. Wasting no time, the doctor pursues, but the large man quickly outpaces him and disappears across the countryside. What have you seen? Could have been the devil for all I know. Staring eyes at the window. Negroid features, mulatto-like. He's got away across the fields. Maybe just as well, I don't think I could have laid hands on him. Ah, oh, but it is. If he is all the same scale as his foot, then he is certainly a giant. To David Stewart Davies, dramatist Jeremy Paul confided that Wisteria Lodge was, quote, the very devil to adapt. The original story was actually one of Doyle's longer tales, appearing in The Strand in two parts. So when it was chosen to be adapted for the Granada series, significant modifications had to be applied. In this scene, the mulatto, as he is credited, makes his first appearance at Wisteria Lodge. And while the story eventually explains the reasons for his appearance, the show does not. Conan Doyle presented a character who returned to retrieve a lost religious fetish, an object of great personal value, from the house after a hasty departure. But in the script, all traces of black magic and the man's voodoo religion have been expunged. According to Jeremy Paul, those elements seemed to have been dropped in by Doyle only for a bit of color, and cuts simply had to be made. Incidentally, the character was portrayed here by veteran Trinidadian character actor Sonny Caldenez, who enjoyed an eclectic career, starting off as a professional wrestler in Spain and ending up as an actor, appearing in dozens of projects from Doctor Who and The Man with the Golden Gun to Raiders of the Lost Ark and The Fifth Element. He passed away last year at the age of 89. Inspector, is there any clue as to the exact hour of the man's death? One o'clock. Oh. It rained about that time, and the death certainly occurred before the rain. No! No, no! That, 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 that is perfectly impossible, Mr. Baines. No, no, his voice is very unmistakable. I, I could swear to it that it was he who addressed me in my room at that very hour. Well, he spoke to me in, you know, that funny accent of his. He said, he's uh, nearly one o'clock. Remarkable, but one must not confuse the unlikely with the impossible. <laughs> what does he mean with that? Astute viewers will note that Mr. Scott Eccles takes his leave following this scene, never to return in the episode, and thereby, again, leaving behind some rather sizable unanswered questions in his wake. These omissions were on producer Michael Cox's mind when he penned the article Reflections on Film Adaptation of Fiction. For the book, it's a print in 1994. He wrote, One of the sad things about the final version of Wisteria Lodge is that the whole explanation of what John Scott Eccles is doing at Wisteria Lodge and why Garcia invited him there has been omitted from the edited version. There is no further reference to Garcia's attempt to establish an alibi, and at this point, Eccles disappears from the story. So this central hinge of the plot, which depended on a servant altering a clock, together with Garcia's reason for misleading Eccles, were included in Jeremy Paul's script. 
but cut from the final film. Obviously, that was not a decision that was lightly taken. In the editorial process, something had to go. It was probably a few minutes over, and what went, of course, was one of those scenes which a director friend of mine calls the there's one thing I still don't understand, Inspector, scenes. By the time you need the explanation, Eccles has disappeared from the story and other concerns have taken over. So it must have seemed, to others, legitimate to omit the explanation. It seems to me to be a flaw, and I blame myself for not having noticed it and corrected it. Back in town, Holmes and Baines go their separate ways, each following their own lines of inquiry. Elsewhere, a troubled governess gazes over the countryside from her second-story window, before stumbling down the stairs to a forced dinner with her imposing employer, his two daughters, and his frightful attaché. The downtrodden woman wearily weeps into her hands. Later, at the Bull Hotel, Watson returns to find his friend has vanished, leaving behind a note which reads, Gone to town for the day, rent two bicycles. But on his table, the good doctor finds a number of other papers, including a list of locations, and he sets out on an investigation of his own. Arriving at High Gable, Watson notices a woman in an elevated window flailing for help. But suddenly, he is assailed by two children who leap onto his back and drive him playfully into the foyer of the estate, where he is met by a sinister Mr. Lucas. Dr. my friend and fellow cartographer. Uh, yes, indeed. You know, we were so engrossed, inclined to chase the bridal path to um, the now vanished hamlet of Ogdor, St. Mary, oh, awesome. that um, we mislaid each other. And since we were late for Mr. Henderson, I thought, I'm so glad you found your way here. Well, I, did I very much regret that Mr. Henderson is too busy to see you today. No, Lucas. I will see you. Gentlemen. The purpose of our visit is to inquire into the history of High Gable, which we believe has an intriguing and bloodthirsty past. I mean, since the days of the English Civil War. I would have no knowledge of that. I'm only a recent invader. Ah. <laughs> but there are local records in the library. There are no records of any past violence in this house. I see. Then I will detain you no more. Good day. In the role of tonight's villainous Mr. Henderson, a.k.a. Don Mario, the Tiger of San Pedro, we have English actor Basil Hoskins. Born in Edmonton, Hoskins fell in love with performing at an early age and studied acting at RADA, later joining the Nottingham Playhouse Company. He spent five seasons with the Shakespeare Memorial Company at Stratford, playing leading roles, including Lucius to Laurence Olivier's Titus Andronicus, and later touring Australia with the Old Vic Company alongside Catherine Hepburn. And while he is well known for his roles in films like Ice Cold and Alex with John Mills, and Northwest Frontier with Lauren Bacall, and he's equally known in television circles for playing the part of number 14 on the Prisoner episode Hammer into Anvil, he dedicated the majority of his career to the theater. And according to his Telegraph obituary, alternating between the classics and musical comedy, Hoskins had the height, looks, carriage, and voice to range from suitors and flirts, deceived husbands and anxious lovers, to sardonic men of the world. Heartthrobs were an early speciality. His distinguished stage career included appearances opposite such stars as Vivian Lee in Duel of Angels, Alec Guinness in Terence Radigan's Ross, and his old friend Lauren Bacall in the long-running musical Applause. 
he retired from the stage and screen in the late 1990s. Hoskins was also the long-term romantic partner of fellow English actor Harry Andrews, who portrayed Lord Bellinger in the Granada adaptation of The Second Stain. The two gentlemen are buried side by side in the churchyard of St. Mary's at Salehurst. Born on June 10, 1929, Basil Hoskins passed away on January 17, 2005, in London at the age of 75. Back at the hotel, Holmes brings Watson up to speed. Now, the Henderson girls whom you encountered have a governess, a Miss Burnett, an Englishwoman. Here is a very singular fact. She has not been seen since the night of the murder. She has utterly vanished. I've seen her. Of course! I've seen her, and she is alive. I saw her at the window at High Gable. My God, a prisoner. She slipped my mind. The moment those awful gorgons descended upon me. She is alive. I've seen her. In the street below, the duo witnessed the violent arrest of the imposing man chased by Watson at Wisteria Lodge. Holmes attempts to convince Baines of the folly of this maneuver, but the inspector holds to his position. Later, on bicycles, Holmes and Watson take the law into their own hands and make their way to High Gable, but arrive too late to stop the abduction of the governess, Miss Burnett, and she is loaded into a carriage which speeds towards the train station. Our heroes pursue as fast as their cycles can carry them. They arrive too late to stop the train, but Miss Burnett manages to escape her captors and jumps from the moving platform. She is saved by Dr. Watson, and as the train speeds out of the station, Holmes smiles, observing that the burly mulatto gentleman has also secured passage. Tonight's narrowly escaping heroine, the governess, Miss Burnett, a.k.a. Senora Victor Durando, was portrayed by British actress Kika Markham. Kika was born Erica Sarah Louise Markham in Macclesfield, Cheshire, on November 7, 1940. The daughter of veteran actor David Markham and writer Olive Den, her career in cinema, television, and theater has been a lifelong one. She first took to the stage at age 12, sharing the spotlight with her father in a Lester production of The Drunkard. Her appetite whetted, she went on to receive acting training at Guildhall School and got her professional start in a Terence Radigan play, which was directed by John Gielgud. Markham, however, was sacked early on in the production for a perceived lack of confidence. This only strengthened her resolve to improve and soon she successfully branched into the world of film and television. In fact, she first met Wisteria Lodge director Peter Hammond on an episode of Armchair Cinema in 1974, and he was so impressed with her ability to perform in Extremis that he immediately cast her when it came time to shoot this episode. But of her hundreds of credits on stage and screen, her film roles in 1981's Outland with Sean Connery, Francois Truffaut's Two English Girls in 71, and Killing Me Softly with Heather Graham are some of her most well-known. Kika's personal life is also of note, as she married actor Corin Redgrave in 1985, making her the sister-in-law of Vanessa Redgrave, and thereby the aunt of actress Natasha Richardson, who memorably portrayed Violet Hunter in Granada's Copper Beaches. Kika chronicled her life with her husband in her biography, Our Time of Day which is a moving account of their relationship after Corin suffered a heart attack and severe memory loss, which left him unable to remember the majority of their 30-year marriage. Kika is still very active today, and she was generous enough to speak with us about her memories of Wisteria Lodge. Well, actually, when I got off the train, by the way, that was quite dangerous. Yeah. It jolted when I, when I slightly... Well, you don't really see, but I nearly fall off the train because <laughs> it, 
it went, you know, because the train just stops moving. I've got a costume. They wouldn't allow that to happen now, you know. Mm -hmm. Was that just one take, or did you do a couple of drops? Well, I'm not sure. I think there was a bit of, you know, watch out. There was a bit of swearing that went on. I mean, either <laughs> somebody sta started the train just before I was, you know, and they said I had to get off very quickly, but I hadn't realized it would be starting when right. I was wearing... You're not, I wasn't just wearing a long skirt, I was wearing lots of petticoats as well and stuff. I could have gone, mm. I could have gone completely right. <laughs> yeah, head, yeah. Over, head over heels. But the pro problem about that is, though, it's very hard to, it's co working on coal and, 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 and steam, you know, the real thing. Yeah. So you have to be very clever. It's a bit like horses and carriages, that's another thing, you know. People assume it's very easy, but it, it isn't. I'll tell you something, it may not be of interest to you, I've been killed an awful lot <laughs> in my career, in my life. Very often I ended up as a corpse. <laughs> it was so nice not to be killed in the show. Um, yeah, you made it through on this yeah, one. Yeah, I made it through. I made it through <laughs> for one of the few times. I mean, you're right. Jeremy was somebody I was um, in awe of him. We didn't really have time to get to know each other. I, you know, I would have probably liked to, but I think I was quite in awe of him. So, mm. whereas... You know, Edward Hardwick and Freddie, they were so much easier, you know, to kind of like talk to and have a bit of a laugh or whatever. But Jeremy, Jeremy he was a very personable man. He, he was he was dignified and, and, and very, you know, not at all. He didn't come over like, you know, um, some people did, I'm afraid, you know, who, who thought they were the, you know. No, he wasn't like that. You got the feeling that he was, and you know, he liked Freddie Jones, you know, taking the Mickey out of him, taking the piss out of him. And, you know, he would laugh. He was a good sort. He was a really, you know, and um, fun. Back at the hotel, Holmes, Watson, and Baines exchange information as Miss Burnett recovers. Why did you arrest the mulatto? But I was sure that Henderson, as he calls himself, felt he was suspected. And he would make no move so long as he thought he was in danger. So I arrested the wrong man. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you will rise high in your profession, Inspector. Oh. You have instinct and intuition. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. But we can't arrest without Miss Burnett's evidence, can we? I should be able to give you that in a moment, but... Tell me, who is this man, Henderson? He's Don Murillo, known as the Tiger of San Pedro. One of the most dangerous men out of Central America. Oh, indeed. A most lewd and bloodthirsty tyrant. Who imposed his odious vices upon a cowering people for almost 12 years. Was it the San Pedro colors, green and white, that first put you onto it? That and my visit to London the Spanish Embassy in the Foreign Office. Now, please, this is your case, Inspector. Oh. Five years ago, there was a rising against the tyrant, but it was an empty palace they stormed. Don Murillo, his secretary, two children, and all the wealth had escaped by ship. And from that moment, they disappeared from the face of the earth. Its identity has been a subject of constant comment in the European press. We discovered him a year ago. How came you into this matter, Miss Burnett? An English lady in such a murderous affair. Because there is no other way in the world by which justice can be gained. What does the law of England care about the rivers of blood shed so many years ago in San Pedro? or the shipload of treasure that this man has stolen from us. To you, they're like crimes committed in some other planet. We know. My real name is Signora Victor Durando. My husband was the minister of San Pedro in London. He met and married me there. A nobler man never lived upon the earth. Unhappily, Murillo heard of his excellence and recalled him on some pretext and shot him by a stroke of, of premonition. 
My husband had refused to take me with him. Mrs. Durando goes on to explain that those whom Murillo had wronged band together and swore to bring justice upon him. She covertly obtained a job as a governess to his children, and she bided her time, secretly communicating with Garcia until the moment came to strike. But in the end, her note to Garcia was intercepted and used instead to lure him to his death. The interrogation scene of Miss Burnett is a striking one, filled with color, symbolism, and flashbacks of violence, and is very much the hallmark of its director, Peter Hammond. However, according to the standards of some, the scene went too far, as Michael Cox recounted in his book. This scene gives us some remarkable images, but probably explains why William Reese Mogg chairman of the Broadcasting Standards Council, accused us of gratuitous violence. Flashbacks to the torture of Miss Burnett and the killing of Garcia are indeed bloodthirsty stuff, but hardly in the Nightmare on Elm Street League. These sequences belong to the original story and are necessary to show how Garcia's plot to assassinate the tiger was foiled and why the tiger must die. In the end, Michael Cox was able to justify each moment to the censors and the episode made it to the air, unscathed. But the Granada team were strongly cautioned against similar excesses in the future. However, every cloud has a silver lining, and the hubbub around the censorship of Wisteria Lodge garnered an article from Miles Kingston of the Times defending Conan Doyle's descriptions of the harsher side of Victorian society. And this, in turn, drew the attention of Dame Jean Conan Doyle, last remaining daughter of Sir Arthur, who wrote an encouraging letter to Michael Cox, stating, My father was a realist about violence, not a sadist. Although very masculine, he was a very gentle man himself, except when aroused by bullies. I think, however, that he would have thought Sir William's objections very mamby-pamby. In his book, Cox continued, the additional dialogue for Murillo, which was added to the scene in question, is in the best tradition. Quote, now they send their wives and sons. Will you never learn? I am indestructible. End quote. At this point, he turns and his face is caught in some uneven metal surface, which produces a distorted reflection, suggesting both corruption and death. For once, Peter Hammond uses a mirror to great dramatic effect. The aforementioned effect was one about which director Peter Hammond was quite particular, as A.D. David Hansen recalled in our recent interview. The, the things like the, the mirror, for instance, I just told you about the mirror, that was um, something that Peter was looking forward to shooting. And uh, the stage crew were meant to operate the effect. It basically was tinfoil against glass, right. almost. And so when he wanted, Peter wanted it distorting, the, st the stage sound he was doing, it was called Rudy. And Rudy said, I, I don't know what you want me to do. And Peter said, I want you to caress it. <laughs> I, I want you to caress it like you're at home with your wife. He said, are you, are you a married man, Rudy? Uh, and Rudy said, yeah. He said, well, you won't know how to do it then. Let me do it. <laughs> and so Peter got on the other side of the mirror and he was the one actually doing the rubbing. I have no doubt that my life, too, hung in the balance. For most of the time, I was confined to my room, terrorized by the most horrible threats to break my spirit. Occasionally, I was allowed out, but only when they had first drugged my food. And it was in this state that you found me at the station. And thanks to this good man, I am beyond their power forever. Well, Inspector, our police work is done, but our legal work begins. Exactly, Mr. Holmes, yes. Garcia's death in the hands of a plausible lawyer could look like an act of self-defense. Well, I think better the law than that. Self-defense is one thing, but to entice a man in cold blood with the object of murdering him is another. Whatever danger you fear from him. 
I think we shall see justice done at the next Guildford Assizes. Of course, you have released the mulatto. Yes, sir. He's a free man again. And your man is with the fugitives on the train? Yes, sir. Yes, and I've wired Scotland Yard to have uh, their men at Waterloo Station to receive them. Yes. <laughs> you know, I really must congratulate you, Inspector. Your powers, if I may say so, without offence, are superior to your opportunities. You're right, Mr. Holmes. In the provinces, we stagnate. A case like this gives a man a chance. <laughs> Elsewhere, the train carrying Murillo barrels across the open countryside. But the serenity of the voyage is broken by the sound of two flintlock pistols firing together at their long-awaited targets. Original air date on the ITV network was April 20th, 1988 at 9 p.m. Dramatized by Jeremy Paul and directed by Peter Hammond. The closing music of Wisteria Lodge showcases a uniquely rustic South American guitar motif, which Patrick Gowers specially employed for this episode. And, in fact, the composer tapped his longtime friend, Grammy Award-winning Australian classical guitar virtuoso John Williams, to perform this memorable score. Gowers had previously featured Williams playing in his soundtrack for the 1978 film Stevie about the poet Stevie Smith, and even later wrote a guitar concerto for Williams known as the Stevie Concerto, inspired by the film. But as for Wisteria Lodge, the collaboration between these two world-class artists results in a wonderfully eclectic score that stands unique from the other music of the series. But the time has come to join Luke by the fire, arrange our thoughts, and in due sequence, discuss this wonderful installment of the Granada series. John Scott Eccles sought peace down in Surrey, but while resting he found only worry dead but why, no idea, is his young host Garcia, John sees Holmes in a very great hurry. From Asimov's Sherlockian Limericks, published in 1978 by the Mysterious Press. I don't know that it's his best one. <laughs> when there's a lot of punctuation and parentheses in it, it's usually not a good sign. Yeah, this is a struggle. Well, it's great to be talking Sherlock again. Yeah. This is probably going to end up being like a seven-hour episode because mm -hmm. we have so much to catch up on. But we've got to talk about the new edition of Bending the Willow, which we finally have in hand. We had an article published in the Sherlock Holmes magazine while we were away. So much to get to, and we will. But first things first, Wisteria Lodge. I, well, I think before we dive in, we should kind of talk generally about the episode. Yeah. I mean, it's a weird one. Lots weird. of reflections. Yeah. Tiny reflections, exquisitely <laughs> small reflections, and... I was just going to say, we probably don't have time to dissect every single one. Yeah, well, for sure. I, th I counted the reflections, actually. Really? If you count every shot through glass and every reflection, you're at 31. Well, I wonder if there's one or two that you caught, because only on, like, the fifth rewatch did I catch one. Well, there's, like, reflections in people's eyeballs and, th and <laughs> well, their glasses. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but there's one that, like, definitely didn't need to be done. Oh, really? So it's when Watson is attacked by the Gorgons. Oh, right. And he comes in, and he's like, Doctor, this is yeah, my good yeah, friend. Yeah. I caught that one, yeah. Oh, okay, because he's just sitting right on the other side. If they just pan the other way, you'd be looking at Jeremy. Right, but they chose to go for the reflection. Yeah. No, I mean, and honestly, in my count... I started to realize what I should have also been counting was shadow play. Yep. Because there's a bunch of shadows and things that happen in this one, too. A lot of it is good, though. A lot of it is, like, extraneous. Or yeah. Maybe a little unnecessary, but there's a lot of good stuff in no, this it's one. It's good. I mean, I, we'll, we'll definitely come to it, but, I mean, this is about as much Peter Hammond as I would want. I don't think I want more Peter Hammond. I don't think you could get more Peter Hammond. I mean, well, I think you can, and we'll see in the well, Mazarin Stone. Well, I guess that's true, but there's like, I think maybe the excuse there is there's not as much story. True. This one, you, you have a lot of story and a lot of Peter Hammond. I mean, the colored light, I mean, yeah. stained glass. Like, there's so much. There's so much we could talk about. One thing I was going to say, maybe just gets 2023 in terms of 
being slightly more sensitive, mm-hmm. referring to the mulatto. Mm, yeah. Because he doesn't have a name. Right. We'll just refer to him as the cook going yeah, forward because for that's sure. his actual title. In <laughs> for this. sure. That's a good idea. Let's start at the very beginning. Did you notice the little guitar flourish at the end of the intro music? I think so. Yeah, yeah. Presumably that's guitarist John Williams sitting in on the theme song session this time. And not Star Wars John Williams. Right. Different John Williams. But uh, yeah, you can hear him throughout that intro music just kind of with some of the string plucks, but yeah. it's obviously a classical guitar, so it's it's really just barely there. I never even noticed it before, but it was... It kind of feels like a harpsichord or something sometimes. But it's it's just it's because we know John Williams played on this one, I'm pretty sure it's him. Yeah. And speaking of the music, I just have to say, just in case anyone is curious, in the first half of the podcast, I included a piece of Patrick Gower's music that I have never utilized before, and that's the music that accompanies the Basil Hoskins biography. But that track is John Williams playing Gower's theme song, but it's from the film Stevie. Hmm. But yeah, I, I just it just kind of magically seemed to fit in that part, so I stuck it in there. But yeah, if you if you like guitarist John Williams and composer Patrick Gower's, <laughs> you can yeah. pick up that soundtrack digitally on Amazon. But um, let's get back to the show. My very first note, can't say it's a great one, at the very beginning mm-hmm. when Garcia and Eccles are in the carriage, I don't know if you noticed this. They stop for a moment and they watch Henderson's handsome cab as it makes its way to High Gable. But when they stop their carriage, the audio effect literally just cuts out. I did notice that. Yeah, it's like somebody just, they forgot to fade it. They forgot to change it. It's just like audio stops yeah. in that moment. And it's its pretty jarring once you hear it and you can't unhear it, unfortunately. I wish I could. But, you know, my first good note, my first great note is the first shot of Holmes at the fireplace with Watson in the mirror. I mean... You know, if you didn't know it was Peter Hammond and you didn't know you were going to be getting 30 more of these shots, mm-hmm. it's a great start. It's a great way to start the episode. The, the thing I like about that shot is that he's actually got the pipe in his mouth. Yeah. And he's talking with it. Yeah. And he manages to kind of roll the R in grotesque still with it in his mouth. Yeah. It's just, it's just an interesting little little detail. Well, and speaking of Holmes and his pipe, uh, you know, when he says, do you know how bored I've been? He taps the stem of his pipe on Watson's chair as he walks by. Mm-hmm. I love that. It's a nice little moment. I never noticed it before, to be honest. But then there's that whole moment. <laughs> he throws his pipe down on the papers and tosses everything into the air, yeah. including his pipe. Yeah. You can hear it clatter. Yeah, around. you hear it like hit the ground. And uh, I mean, it's it's wonderful stuff to see him throwing the papers but it's a, it kind of makes me wonder, you know, we, we've heard from David Hansen about, you know, the fireplace scene and yeah, uh, how... He had something out for the props people. <laughs> well, that, but also, you know, he was maybe a little bit on the manic side for this episode. Yeah. Maybe, you know, I don't know. I can't, I, I can't help but love this, this sequence. But he just seems very animated and sharp in yeah. this sequence. Like you say, like with Scott Eccles, mm-hmm. with Watson... He yeah. just seems more active and sharp. No, and I, I love it. I do love it. Yeah. But, I mean, I, I had to run it back a few times just to see where that pipe flew. I couldn't find it. One question I had is when it says post office train cross, and he says, was it a man or a woman? He says, oh, man. Why would he think it was a woman? Okay. Is this well, a mystery? <laughs> this kind of brings me to a small elephant in the room because you and I have talked about this off the air many times, and I'm talking about the name... Mr. Scott Eccles. Mm-hmm. And it turns out that this is much more of a rabbit hole than you might expect, but we're, we're kind of here. So let, let's talk about the name Mr. John Scott Eccles. Well, because everybody calls him Mr. Scott Eccles, <laughs> even well, Garcia. I was very curious about this. For a long time, I don't know why, I just assumed this was somehow like a playful interaction on the part of Holmes and Baines. Mm-hmm. You know, like like they were just having fun with his name. And I wanted to clarify this, so I reached out to the experts on all things Sherlockian, Bert and Scott over at I Hear a Sherlock Everywhere. Mm. And Scott Monty was kind enough to write me back with an incredible treatise on the topic, which I want to read part of here. He starts off by saying, the short answer about the name John Scott Eccles is it's a matter of compound names being more common in England and in Victorian times, but it's far more complicated than that. The compounding is downright confounding. And so he did some research into this, and he found a few references, which he shared. He wrote, Donald Redmond, in a study in Sources, stated, Mr. Scott Eccles, or Mr. Eccles, for again, we have the problem of an unhyphenated, apparently compound surname, is an interesting one. Hmm. On Holmes' own usage, the compound name must be rejected, for he does refer to Mr. Eccles. And an identical problem will present itself in the matter of Arthur Cadogan West, in the Bruce Partington plans. 
the Victorians hang on to the middle name almost as lovingly as the Russians. And so Scott also quotes a few other researchers who found similar names that were in the news at the time with similar middle names on which Doyle almost certainly based this character. But the idea of the middle name is then refuted by a different scholar. David Skeen Melvin in the Baker Street Journal of June 71 states, compound names are quite common in the canon, but such being relatively uncommon, not to say rare in the United States, I'm not surprised that they have not been recognized as such, even when it's obvious. In Wisteria Lodge, there is Mr. John Scott Eccles, whose surname is quite obviously, from the way and manner in which it's used, the compound name of Scott Eccles, even though he's referred to as both Mr. Scott Eccles and Mr. Eccles. Even more obvious is the compound surname of Arthur Cadogan West in the Bruce Partington plans. That unfortunate young man is referred to as Arthur Cadogan West, Young West, and mostly as Cadogan West. Mm. This hypothesis is proven by Sherlock Holmes' own words. Upon announcing that he and Watson are leaving to visit the boy's parents, he says, now we shall turn to the Cadogan Wests. Mm. Okay. And then there was a big back and forth between all these scholars debating the issue. But there was another point made, which was about Doyle himself, which I thought was fascinating, so I'll read that here too, which was, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle is an example of what can happen. His surname and that of his family was Doyle. He preferred to use A. Conan Doyle and is recorded as having exclaimed summarily to someone, my name, sir, is Conan Doyle, meaning his go-by name was Conan. Mm -hmm. His son Adrian, having the same middle name, Conan, like his father, preferred to consider his name to be Conan Doyle. <laughs> yeah. But on the official Doyle Estate website, it clarifies that Conan Doyle was not originally his surname, mm -hmm. but that he only adopted it as a compound surname after high school. And in a letter from Dame Jean, his daughter, she clarified that, quote, he took the name as part of his surname because he wanted to perpetuate the family name of his grandmother and a favorite uncle. So I, apparently he never officially changed it. He just started using it. So It's messy. Yeah, I mean, the, the, I'm not sure that part helped to clarify anything about Scott Eccles. But <laughs> well, but the but, problem is, in the story, the way the telegram ends is, have just had the most incredible and grotesque experience. May I consult you, Scott Eccles? Right. And then he says, man or woman. I, I'm going to come to that part now. Okay. So basically after Scott sent me this email, he closed by saying, now, is Scott his surname? <laughs> <laughs> he says, I don't know that this rather long treatise has cleared anything up for you, or if Conan Doyle himself even had clarity. It does seem to be a moving target, even some 120 years later. It is, of course, a trifle, but there's nothing so important as trifles. Mm -hmm. And he let me know that they're actually going to be doing an episode of their podcast, Trifles, on this topic okay. uh, very soon. So keep your eyes peeled for that, as I'm sure they will dive very deeply into this. So, and again, you know, many thanks to Scott for that. But you see, the thing that threw me off from the beginning was the thing that you just said, which is the telegram. Because he doesn't say Mr. No, no, he just says, sign Scott Eccles. But but then it, it'd be like John Reese Davies signing his name Reese Davies. But Reese isn't a woman's name. Well, right. <laughs> but but then, is, was Scott a, a surname or? But see, here's the thing. Unless Scott is also a woman's name, I guess it seems to clarify that it must be a compound name because otherwise, why ask that question? You know what I mean? Because, <laughs> well, because yeah. if it's... If the, you or know was I mean? he just not listening? Well, I guess it could, could be that. <laughs> I don't know, but maybe in Sherlock Land or Victorian England, Scott Eccles was a very common hyphenated compound last name and they mm, just knew. Maybe. Yeah, <laughs> well, see, Klinger in his book, he states that no one would have wasted money including their first name in a telegram. And that's how we're supposed to be assured that it is a compound surname. Yeah, that just raises more <laughs> questions, though. Because then you, then why would you, why would you add a compound surname? Why don't you just put your first name? Why not just put John Eccles? Well, maybe it's just because Scott is is a first name. Yeah, that it's so common and so that it sticks out to us. But I don't notice this in any other episode. I don't. Right. I mean, maybe Cadog and West is is the, yeah. is the, is the, the other exception. exception. Yeah. But. Everybody in this calls him Mr. Scott Eccles. Well, then maybe that's the answer. I mean, the thing that, I mean, if everybody always called him Mr. Scott Eccles, I think we'd have our answer. But the problem is in the book, they refer to him as Mr. Eccles. Right. And they refer to him as Scott Eccles. Isn't there a J. Scott Eccles also? Yeah, there's John Scott Eccles, yeah. Well, I mean, J. Oh, there might be. That would make you think he doesn't go by his first name, he goes by his middle name, which is Scott. <laughs> <laughs> it just seemed like a weird kind of 
affectation or something. Well, and I, I think, know. you know, some of these people, again, it's like it's maybe it's because we're Americans, you know. Probably. Maybe, maybe we're just missing the. Maybe in 20 years we'll all be going by like Twitter handles and <laughs> first and last names won't make any sense anyway. Very possibly. Well, back to Baker Street. Yeah. Lots of references to old cases and episodes in this one. Yeah. So that's kind of neat just because it feels like as you've been making your way through the series, some of these cases, well, technically only one of them, you were along the ride for. Then it kind of tells you like, oh, there's other stuff that they're doing what we're not seeing. But it's, yeah. it's just kind of fun because you're, you've been along for the ride at this point. Well, some scholars out there propose that Colonel Carruthers, as he's mentioned here, mm-hmm. is a typo. And it's it's an accidental mix of Colonel Moran and Mr. Carruthers from the Solitary Cyclist. Others propose it's a new character. I don't think there's a solid consensus, but assuming, well, assuming that Carruthers wasn't an uncommon name, I think it must be a new person since I don't think Holmes would be that excited about locking up Carruthers from the Solitary Cyclist. Right. <laughs> seems like one for yeah. the scholars to debate. But like you said, I don't know that that was such an amazing case that that seems like a stretch. Yeah. There's a lot of stretches in these uh, annotations. <laughs> <laughs> there always are. I made a note about the wallpaper. All right. I don't know if you recall this, but when we talked to cameraman and DP Lawrence Jones, mm-hmm. he informed us that the brown paper on the walls in Baker Street yeah. is literally just parcel paper, like craft packing paper. Yeah. It's not anything special. And usually it's not something that sticks out. But in this one, I don't know if it's just the lighting. I don't know exactly what it is, but you really get some good shots of that brown paper bag paper on all over mm. the walls. I'll have to go back and watch it the yeah. 12th time. Yeah. I mean, it's we're, we're there now. I mean, Donald Churchill. Yeah. Just the entire interaction with Mr. Scott Eccles is very entertaining. <laughs> like how dis, how disheveled he is, how animated Sherlock is. Yeah. And then Watson just kind of trailing behind him, moving things out of his way, offering cigarettes like a butler. Well, and, and again, I'm sure you recall this from our conversation with David Hansen, and I, I mentioned it in the first part. But it's there kind of was a gauntlet thrown down by Peter Hammond to make this one kind of super theatrical, mm-hmm. you know. And I think it's all very evident from this beginning. It's it's like when he opens the door and he's like, "Mr. Sherlock Holmes," he's like, "Certainly." Good. You know, it's, it's it's very yeah. different than a lot of episodes. And then it just kind of like the I don't want to say ad libbing because we're gonna come back to this because there definitely is some ad libbing going on in this episode, but just kind of the vocal play, you know, when he's like. And, and, and having heard your name quite so, uh, 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 uh. like a lot of sparring in this episode. Yeah, it, the quite so always threw me off too, because like I always thought he said Watson, because <laughs> right when he says it, Watson's like looking through the book that he mm. almost said on, and mm. then as soon as he says it, he looks at Holmes and like closes the book. Mm. And so for the longest time, I thought he was saying like Watson, like yeah, yeah. like pay attention, but he definitely says quite so. Yeah, it's strange, and it's one of those things. Like I'm gonna be honest, like some of that stuff makes the episode feel too loose to me it makes it feel too ad-libbed in a way and i feel like for a long time that really kind of irked me about this episode was that there was so much of that you know like like baines is he laughs at the end of every single sentence you you know and it's it's like there's a lot of that kind of playfulness to the dialogue but i i have come to appreciate it it's like you once said i think the sherlock jazz album if you want to consider all the peter hammond episodes as part of that album it's like he, he tries different things and this is one of those things. I think there was just a, a lot more looseness to the dialogue. I guess so. But I guess Sherlock isn't a police officer. Right. So you catch him on a good day, he acts a certain way. Yeah. I mean, he's he's a private citizen. He does whatever the hell he wants. Mm-hmm. And so somebody comes in the state of their toilet, how Mr. Scott Eccles was, <laughs> right. he kind of messes with you a little bit. And I, th- and I think it was maybe he was, who, who knows, maybe he was a little high at that point. Yeah. And he just wandered in and he's just having fun with him. True. I mean, kind of shouting at him. Mm-hmm. Like, there's a couple points where it, the audio almost clips because he yells so yep. much. And it's just, I think he was just, he's just having fun with it. But I'm, again, like, I don't, you know, I'm not a doctor, so I don't want to judge Jeremy's manic states. Mm. Yeah. But I do feel like there's a lot of moments in this Baker Street scene that make me wonder because uh, I'm sure you remember the moment with the pocket watch. Because there's two ways that moment could play out. It, it basically, he says, it's, it's now quarter past two. And then he looks at the watch and he kind of grins. Mm-hmm. But he says quarter past two before he even looked at the time. So it's almost like he said the line without remembering well, to look at the prop first. And then he kind of gives you this little <laughs> smile. Maybe. But it works really well because it's like, I just confirmed it's quarter past two. Yeah, it could be that. <laughs> like, it could be like, yeah, he knows what time it is, but he's going to confirm it. Yeah. And he's just getting out his watch to rub it in Mr. Scott Eccles' face a little bit. I like the way it came out, but when you, when you think about it the other way... And you look, you know, there's so many times in this episode when Jeremy has a look 
that it's almost like he's looking at the like, director or the, the camera. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Well, there's one in particular. Though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But but these kind of things remind me of that shot in um, Evil Dead when Bubba or whatever his name is opens the door with the shotgun mm-hmm. and he's like backing away from the door. Yeah. The camera goes with him, but then Ash jumps in. Right. But like. He would have seen him. He would have seen him. Right. Yeah. So it's just sometimes things are for the audience versus for the people in the show. It's just a fun moment either way with the pocket watch. And I I don't know. I I always enjoy it. And I mean, I think the whole time Donald Churchill is just adequately flustered. Yeah. And why don't we end on a super duper duper tight shot on his eyeballs? It reminds me of that shot that always irks me from the Redheaded League when they're really close yeah. on Jabez Wilson, and I right. just always feel like it's just too close, people. Well, you know, you got the screen, you got to fill it up. True enough. But I do feel like this kind of leads us to something I want to discuss, which is the theatricality of the episode, as we've called it, and the changes that were made to the script as a result. L- let me explain. So we heard from David Hansen about how Peter Hammond really wanted to do this one as an old-school theatrical endeavor, and I feel like the use of Donald Churchill... And Freddie Jones yeah. really brought an element of improvisation to the episode that might not be automatically obvious. But I feel justified in saying this because I actually have the script for uh. this episode. Uh, it's a long story, but I managed to obtain a handful of rehearsal scripts a while back, which, well, the short version is that I was doing a Google search, as I often do for Granada Sherlock things, And a bookseller by the name of Burwood Books in the UK had a number of shooting scripts for sale, and I snatched them up and actually wrote to them. I'm getting off on a tangent here, but I I wrote to them to find out how they got their hands on this stuff and if they had any more. And it turns out they had obtained them from the estate of Peter Haining, Mm. who wrote, among many other things, the television Sherlock Holmes book. And when he passed, some of his stuff ended up there. So I have a pile of original scripts And some of them are even signed by people like Jeremy Paul. But uh, we'll talk more about all that someday. But today, I thought it would be fun to look at a few bits from the script and, you know, to see where things changed. Because there were a lot of changes. And frankly, it's fascinating to read these because you can really start to see how Donald Churchill and Freddie Jones, especially, and even Jeremy, really kind of started to alter lines <laughs> well, but, or at least play loose with the dialogue. You well, know? with that in mind, I mean, do you know which version of the script you have? I mean, you have the shooting script? Technically, it's a rehearsal script. Okay. So there is that, and it, you know, it could have been rewritten, but when you do compare the two, and I, I went through it scene by scene with the final product, and it's like Kika Markham, mm. every word identical to the script. She changed nothing. Yeah, but she, I mean, <laughs> not to downplay her role... The weird thing about her role in this is a lot of it is voiceover. Well, that's true. And that's a whole other thing because I have some comments about that. But, <laughs> but I mean, most of the other actors, yeah. all their lines are exactly what they are in the script. But it's like it's, some very important things have changed. So I figured we'd read a few. I, I just picked out a couple of key parts just to give you a taste of yeah. the changes that happened. Do you want to just do them in order then as yeah. we go through the episode? Yeah, let's definitely do that. Okay. So. We mentioned about how close the book opening sequence of this was to the original story in the beginning of the episode, when he talks about the five orange pips and all that. Right. Well, it was originally even more direct from Doyle. Uh, There was a tiny bit that got cut, presumably for time, because we also know that was an issue. We also know budget was an issue, which we'll come back to. Well, we know this is a longer story than normal. Yeah. So to condense it, they make Yeah, exactly. And, and, And as Jeremy Paul said, it was the devil to adapt. Right. But that first scene originally went like this. So Watson says, will you see him? And Holmes says, my dear Watson, do you know how bored I've been since we locked up Colonel Carruthers? My mind is like a racing engine tearing itself to pieces because it's not connected up with work for which it was built. Life is commonplace. The papers are sterile. Audacity and romance seem to have passed forever from the criminal world. Can you ask me then whether I am ready to look into a new problem, however trivial it may prove? But here, unless I'm mistaken, is our client. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so it's basically just exactly from the story. Sometimes, why, why wouldn't you? Yeah. Well, that's just it, though. But honestly, I feel like this leaner version that it's in the show is better. Because, you know, it gives him the chance to say, of course I'll see him. Yeah. I mean, the thing about the, you know, the, the race car engine tearing itself to pieces, it's a, it's a little clunky to say out loud sometimes, mm-hmm. I think. So I think it was probably a good choice. Yeah. But it is interesting that they kind of just lifted that paragraph right Yeah. Out of and I mean, I can just imagine them sitting at a rehearsal room going, this isn't working, guys. Let's, yeah. let's scratch that much. line, scratch that line. I'll, I'll stencil in another word, you know, that kind of thing. But 
Another example of, I think, tightening the thing up is in scene seven, when Eccles is narrating his flashback, Mm. there's just more to his explanation. So this is scene seven in the dining room. Scott Eccles says, we discovered a common interest in cartography, or so I thought. That's the study of old maps. I have rather a fine collection of county maps done by Moole and Drayton and Vandenkir. Largely on the strength of that, I accepted his invitation to spend a few days at his house. The plan was to retrace Surrey as Thomas Moole engraved it some 50 years ago. Well, as soon as I arrived yesterday evening, I knew something was wrong. The atmosphere of the place, the house was tumble down, depressing. Garcy had told me I had a wonderful cook, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know what I mean? He just talks about maps. So, yeah. I mean, we get the, we got the point, so I, it's understandable they would shorten this one. Yeah. You know, but by that same token, it comes back in something else that was cut out of the script. So it, um, I wanted to read that one so you'd, so you'd hear it. All right. But anyway, so, so this is interesting. The flashback scene continues with uh, Eccles asking for more wine at the table. Right. <laughs> Again, this is a kind of an example of, of an ad lib because that line where he's like, I- I'd like a drink of that if possible. <laughs> That's not in the script. <laughs> so like, I- I'm sure that was just added. I mean, oh, it, doesn't, I w- it doesn't sound like something Jeremy Paul would write. You know what I mean? I wondered if that was something that maybe they did in rehearsal and they were like, you should do that. Could be. You know. Yeah. But this scene is interesting because there's, there's a lot of Spanish being spoken here. Mm-hmm. And the way it's written in the script is like this. Garcia says, forgive me, uh, Louis, some more wine for our guest. And Scott Eccles says, oh, thank you. And says, but Louis ignores Garcia's instruction to fill the guest's glass. Instead, he whispers in Spanish to Garcia, what are we going to do? Garcia replies in Spanish, wait, be patient, do nothing foolish. It is not important that we understand this. Like Scott Eccles, we are puzzled and mystified by the Spaniard's behavior. Loud ringing at the front door, et cetera, et cetera. So, so again, it's, just, it's, it's written in the script that they would speak in Spanish, but he didn't even write the Spanish. Mm. in you know what i mean so i, I in, in <laughs> i didn't check it to make sure it's actually what's in the script but that's how the script is really it's not the script is just like hey chill out man it's like it's just <laughs> be calm be calm everything's fine we'll hear from them soon like it I, yeah you know and i wondered if it was like fill in spanish here it could be you know yeah yeah well and another example we were just talking about Eccles with his line you know can i get a drink of that yeah there's another line that's not in the script when Holmes says his line about not confusing the unlikely with the impossible and Eccles goes what do you mean by that? Yeah. Not in the script. Yeah, but that, yeah. I mean, maybe that's those kind of things, that, you know, <laughs> the stage actors or something, they're like, yeah, yeah we'll leave it in. Because they could have cut the audio for that. Of course. Because it's like from in a wide, wide shot. I mean, it's one of those things where, again, back in the day, I didn't love it, but I've grown to love it because it's just a fun little transition. To me, it, it, it works for that character, you know, because he is a mess the whole time. Yeah. Speaking of being a mess... Pretty less than flattering shot of Mr. Scott Eccles reversing out of bed, <laughs> bare-legged in his yeah. sleeping shirt. Well, we'll come to that because uh, I don't know if it's a good note or a bad note, but his throat clearing sounds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's just such a theater thing. You know yeah, what I mean? well, it's yeah, just... I could have lived without that, and I could have probably lived seeing his bare butt in a reflection yeah. rather than right in my face. Right, exactly. Yeah, it's a bit much. But... While we're on the script, let's look at the most important thing that was cut, which is the entire explanation of Scott Eccles' mystery, (laughs) (laughs) which was in the original script. Yeah. And it it happens in scene 24, after Baines and Holmes go their separate ways. It starts off the same. Here, let me read it. Well, because in the episode, they kind of go their separate ways, and they also just go, goodbye, Mr. Scott Eccles. (laughs) Like, you're out of the episode now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but in that very next shot where they're kind of walking and, and the shot is high and shot through a window down to the street, that's where this scene takes place. And here's what the original dialogue was. He says, goodbye, Mr. Scott Eccles. Scott Eccles says, goodbye. Holmes and Watson continue walking. Holmes says, it would greatly surprise me if Garcia had ever heard of Thomas Moole or Ogilby or Vanderkeer. So what did he want with him? What could Eccles supply? I see no charm in the man. He is not particularly intelligent. Not a man likely to be congenial to a quick-witted Latin. (laughs) Why then was he picked out? Has he any one outstanding quality? Watson says, You could only say that he's the very type of conventional British respectability. Exactly, Watson. Mm -hmm. The very man you need as a witness to impress another Briton. You saw how Baines never dreamed of questioning his statement, extraordinary as it was. Watson says, But what was he to witness? Holmes says, Suppose the household are Confederates in some design. Let us say some criminal enterprise. For why else would Garcia need an alibi? The attempt, whatever it may be, is to come off before one o'clock. By some juggling of the clocks, it's possible they got Scott Eccles to bed earlier than he thought. And when Garcia looked in to tell him it was one o'clock, Watson says, it was really not more than 12. Holmes says, 
If Garcia could do what he had to do and be back by the hour mentioned, here was this irreproachable Englishman ready to swear in any court of law that the accused was in his house all the time. Watson says, but if he did not return, Holmes says, it was probable his life had been sacrificed and his two subordinates might make for some prearranged spot where they could escape investigation. Watson says eagerly, and be in a position to renew their attempt. Holmes says, let us now consider the message. How did it run? Our own colors, green and white. So that's back to the script. Right. That's like three pages of script. I wondered if maybe that was just too much dialogue and, and maybe too straightforward for Peter Hammond, or if it was just time. I guess if something had to go, Explain you know, it, it's just it's a lot of there. talking because then they continue under that se- sequence about the green and white colors and everything. Right. It just goes for a very long time. You're right. But I don't know. It's just, it's, it's the thing I love about reading these pieces. <laughs> it's just, I love reading it. it. It's written for Jeremy Brett so well. You can almost hear his voice saying the words. It's just so damn cool, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and honestly, there's there's literally dozens of differences that we could go through, large and small. Going through the actual story, there were some pieces that I wished were in here, which aren't even the ones you just read. Mm-hmm. Like the way Holmes kind of works out which house it should be. Because the note says seventh door. And he says, you know, not many houses have seven doors on one corridor. Right. This this tells you it's a big house. You know, like that was like a clever, that yeah. was an actual clever deduction that we don't really get from the episode. Yeah. And that wasn't in the script. But there is other stuff in there. The cook. <laughs> yeah. And how he went back to Wisteria Lodge. There's literally no explanation in the episode. No, there is. Well, sort of. They, I mean, they, Bane says maybe he came back for something. Something valuable was probably... It, it, but it was. It sounded... It was like he made it up anyway. Right. But in the script, Jeremy Paul actually posited a different reason. Um, it comes in scene 41 when all the reporters are yelling at Baines after yeah. he uh, announces the arrest. Holmes and Watson have a little side conversation in the background while that's going on. Watson says quietly to Holmes, but why should he return to the house? Holmes, quietly but watching Baines, something precious, something he could not bear to part with, had been left behind. Watson says, the pistol? So it's like... Yeah, that, that, would have been, that would have been good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, but it that, would have been that, nice. that makes sense because there were two pistols. They still needed to shoot someone. Yeah, so but even though it wasn't the voodoo element, which I loved, yeah. I feel like that would have been a very economical alternative. You know, and it would have addressed the issue in a good way. I, I this, don't know why they cut it. This you know? raises another question I had. And I mean, maybe the chain of evidence was different back then. But so they comb the lake. They find the other gun. They find right. the original gun. Yeah. They arrest him. And then they he eventually, just has the gun at the end. Yeah. <laughs> I guess Baines gave it back to They're him. They're like, well, we're, we're going to let you go. And we feel bad for, you know, holding you against your will for no reason. Here's a gun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a question mark. But there's, I don't want to keep going over the, the differences in the script, but there is one other not insignificant difference, which is in the script, they didn't ride bicycles. Mm. They were in a dog cart, which resulted in a carriage chase to the, to the train station. Mm. But presumably, we know they were very far behind budget so apparently you know i assume this would have been cut to save money yeah oh well and i should say this there, there is a little bit more spanish which is semi-translated uh, from scene 56 when they're torturing miss burnett which i'll just read into the record she says my name is senora victor durando it says henderson and lucas exchange startled looks henderson angrily to lucas on his feet durando's widow in my house looking after my children in spanish we could have all been murdered in our beds Mm. Lucas, in Spanish, says, let me kill her now, the traitoress. Henderson, in Spanish, says, not in this house. We could not escape the consequences. Miss Burnett says, you can kill me. What is my life worth? I think not in this house is in there, though, isn't it? Oh, it it? might be. I think it is, because I I use Google Translate, and most of the Spanish was like exactly what you think it was, Mm -hmm. like them saying, be cool, calm down. Right, and right, then right. like when the kids come in, they're like, this guy was was watching us. You know, it's like, it's all pretty, there's not a lot of plot that you're missing. Because I always wonder about that kind of stuff. Well, and I mean, honestly, too, the, 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 during that flashback sequence, Miss Burnett gives her big explanation. But in the original script, we see Garcia moving the hands of the clock. So oh, like, right. again, that would have been a part of, in That's, the script, in the original script, yeah, yeah. it would have been a part of the explanation. But again, they cut even that out. I feel like they could have, they could have, they could have just left that in. Yeah, but what was the point? I think it would have just put a trying, button on it. You know, it, it would have just him. done, it would have just added something at the end when everything is getting clarified to pull all the pieces together, you know? Yeah. Then Baines would have been like, oh, your clock's an hour fast. <laughs> well, again, that would have been something for them to observe, yeah. you know? But anyway, we, we could read the whole script, but I, I just find it fascinating to see these changes and to see what the show went through from script to screen. Yeah. But 
let's get back to the show because... I want to go back to maybe the oddest sequence in the whole series. Hmm. When Inspector Baines walks in for the first time, there's this element of suspense. We know there's people missing. Mm -hmm. We saw the police combing the lake. We saw a fellow lurking in the garden. Now we hear footsteps in an abandoned house. And then we cut to a convex mirror Mm -hmm. of Sherlock and Mr. Scott Eccles caught off guard. And then we pan over to the top two-thirds of a head Mm -hmm. as it says, (laughs) Welcome to Mysteria Lodge, Mr. Holmes. Yeah. No mouth necessary in the shot. Yeah. Just nose and eyes. I seriously believe that the reason for that is because they had to use a certain lens to get that mirror. And that was the most important thing. But he just wanted to make sure it went over to him. And he's like, look, it doesn't matter how good his face is. That mirror is the important thing. Pan over, get him as close as we need to to get the lens to work. I think that's what happened. I... I, I want to talk about, like, the geometry of that shot. Because I don't think the shot makes sense. Yeah. I don't think the eye lines make sense. I think they had that mirror there. I think they saw the mirror. Mm-hmm. And I say they, but I mean Peter Hammond. If you look at it, it's kind of around a corner. Mm-hmm. But where Mr. Scott Eccles is standing is near the fireplace, which is kind of around a different corner. But in the reflection, Holmes and Eccles are similar size. So it's like it's a, it, like the mirror is flat against the two of them and Baines is to the side of it. So Baines would have been standing next to Scott Eccles. Hmm. If you see where it is when we cut to the wide, Mr. Scott Eccles would have been way further back in the mirror. Yeah. In this convex mirror. Doesn't make sense to me. But I think it was just he saw that mirror and he's like, we're using that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's Peter Hammond. I mean, there's some very Peter Hammond uses of color in these yeah. following scenes. I mean, it feels like he lit the ceiling with a prism. Yeah, but you know what I think it is? Yeah. Is this the stained glass? I think it's supposed to be the stained glass. <laughs> but even if it isn't, it's like, it's a great use. I mean, yeah. did they pick out that house for Peter Hammond? See, and again- or did I'm, they put I, the glass in for Peter well, Hammond? Well, this is what I, I was actually wondering about that. Well, that's what I mean, because like, <laughs> I, I have a feeling probably not in terms of the, the stained glass pieces. Yeah. But- I do wonder about the mirror the pieces. Mirror. <laughs> yeah, I feel like he probably went, "What it, could, could we somehow rig a rectangle mirror on three frames of this thing? Think, and Think about 1987 or whatever year this was. Yeah. How small Jeremy's head would have been in that mirror Yeah, in those couple shots. It only on makes, your TV. Yeah, on yeah. your TV back then. It would have been like a postage stamp. Yeah, that shot where, with the stained glass and the panning from left to right, it starts on Jeremy and you see Baines in the background and then it pans over and you see Baines with Jeremy in the background. It pans back and you see the cook sneaking up. Yeah. And, I mean, it's a, it's a, I'll call it great. It's a great shot. I think it's almost great. It's, it's, <laughs> it goes back to the theatrical thing. Yeah, exactly. I feel like... It's when a it's creative happening, shot. It's yeah. a creative shot. Right. When it's happening, I was going, this is a really long pan where we're not seeing anyone talking. Mm-hmm. It's this slow pan. It only makes sense after the fact. Right. That's what makes it feel like it's not a great shot. Yeah. But it is an interesting shot. And I mean, obviously, too, we you know, in this sequence here, we, we heard from David Hansen about Jeremy throwing the ashes all over the place and all that. Mm-hmm. But even in the take we got... Yeah, he's not he very is, careful. He is, I mean, he's hilarious. He's, he's he's tossing the books. He tosses the entire table. Yeah. He picks it up with just a couple fingers and tosses the entire, I'm like, whoa, man. Yeah. Like, that was the calmed down version. Right. It's hard to know whether he was a little manic. It's hard to know whether he was doing the theatrical thing that Peter Hammond wanted. And I, but honestly, I think maybe he was just pushing the envelope because Freddie Jones was there. You know what I mean? I feel like yeah. he just, he felt like he had to step it up had some. Had to be bigger. Even, yeah, a little bigger. Yeah, I wondered. Baines is is so peculiar in, in every sense. You know, eccentric, cunning. You know, he said Michael Cox called his performance smug. Mm-hmm. He's mostly by the books, but he does kind of bend the rules every now and then. But it's almost as if he would have been a great villain. Yeah. And I wonder if that's what was in Doyle's mind at all. You know, it's like a different kind of foe for Sherlock to face. Yeah, it's just a different angle. Yeah. But I wonder if Jeremy took that on board and was thinking, he's going to eat candy, I'm going to throw a guitar right you know like yeah. we're, we're gonna outdo each other no I th- matter what i think there is some of that and to be honest you know knowing what little i've learned about freddie jones he was kind of uh disparaged when he was part of the royal shakespeare company mm. and i you know i, I don't i don't want to read too much into things i'm not sure about but i just feel like when you see he and jeremy facing off in a couple of those moments and the kind of looks they're giving each other I feel like they're two very different kind of actors. Mm. Freddie Jones, very rough and tumble, you know, just very gregarious. Jeremy being more classically trained, more proper, 
And I just kind of feel like that energy between the two styles, maybe not necessarily respecting the other style as much as they could. I think that's probably real. Yeah. You know, and I, I think, think that comes is. across in the episode. There's a couple actors nowadays that I see every now and then, and I think this guy probably pisses people off. Yeah. On set. <laughs> yeah. Just because, you know, people that like act with their hands a lot, mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. and like doing things. I'm sure there's other actors who go, you don't know what you're doing. Yeah. You're, you know, <laughs> and so maybe he was like that. And we just, I mean, to me, a lot of it comes down to the actual performance and whether or not it works. Right. Maybe he does this in every role and it doesn't work most of the time. Well, that's the thing. Like when I, I watched young Sherlock Holmes recently and he's in it, um, Freddie Jones. Yeah. And he's a very dramatic, dark character in that movie. No laughing after every line, you know, no yeah. candies. And it, and it's just like, and then I watched him in another play recently and he's a great guy. He's a great actor. Yeah. But when you see young Sherlock Holmes next to Wisteria Lodge, it's a wildly different performance. So yeah. I do think it's, those are the choices he made for this. Back to the kind of sparring, just Sherlock being dismissive of Baines when he's talking about the, the pistol. Mm-hmm. It doesn't even look up yeah. until the very end. <laughs> yeah. It's just, I, it's, it's, it's like a weird choice. I mean, it, it, I guess it is kind of in keeping with Sherlock being. Yeah, that one to me seems okay. That one seems good. It actually. doesn't even look up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, he also doesn't look at the note. When he when he gets it from yeah, Baines, that, that's he has it behind his back the entire time, but he somehow manages to deduce things about it. But I ran, I ran that back a few times because I was thinking, is there any way he could have caught that stuff? Yeah, but he does glance, he does glance at, at, it. at it very quickly. But I like how he just strolls up, and mm-hmm. gets right in his face, yeah. not looking at the thing, and then yeah, yeah. But interesting. There's a lot of really stuff. unique things in this episode. Really yeah. interesting things. Well, then we get what I like to call the older gentleman chase. Oh, boy. <laughs> Across the frosty heath, you know. I mean, it is what it is. I I, I mean, it, I think it's shot well as not to show them really running yeah. too far or too mm. long. It's, it's one of those things. It's hard to, hard to keep the pace. You know, it's like, why did Watson stop chasing him? You know, I mean, he, he didn't ever well, get that far away. You know, I know. I mean, it's kind of, kind of awkward. I think it is. It is a bit of the old boys running. I mean, I think it was meant to look like he was farther across the field. And maybe lensing didn't help in that situation. Yeah. Well, I mean, they could have just cut it when he breaks the ladder. But he breaks the ladder and then he throws a mostly functional ladder. I know. Over the wall towards Watson. The thing is, is like then Watson wouldn't have been able to pursue him. But, but the then wall in wasn't the very next in the very next shot, he's like two right feet behind him, him yeah. again. You know, it's it's kind of this odd. This is one of these things where I think because of the quality of the people involved in the show, when I see things like this, I try to think of them not as bad, but as an interesting choice that I can't quite fathom. <laughs> I know. Well, I, I think I have an explanation, which is that next shot where Watson stops at the wall. Yeah. There's like a really nice foreground grave marker. Yeah. I think Peter Hammond was like, okay, we, we finished the scene. He broke the ladder, but guess what? It's going to keep going. We're going to get a moment <laughs> more of that because that gravestone is amazing. And we have yeah. to have that in the shot. I don't know. I mean, my guess is that might be what happened. <laughs> Maybe. Whatever it is, Somebody made that call yep. and they did it. I don't think it was accidental. Yep. And so that's why I kind of just go, hmm. Well, there's some nice examples of Sherlock's handwriting on the notes at the Bull Hotel. But I was going to ask you, is this Jeremy's handwriting or were these done by the prop department, do you think? I don't know for sure, but it's definitely different than other handwriting we've seen. And they're completely different to each other. Right. So there's the note <laughs> and then there's the map. Right. I just felt like the note was very nice. Yeah. And if you look up Jeremy Brett's handwriting... It's very rarely nice. That nice? Yeah, exactly. No, it is very nice. And, like, his signature is very nice. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of what you would hope it would be, I think. But that's why I was wondering is maybe was that meant to be Watson drew his own map? Oh, yeah, maybe. Because it's very um, blocky yeah. letters. Yeah, yeah, for and sure. And also, I guess people would have written like that back then. I don't know. Yeah. And then, it, you know, that kind of hangs on the screen. There's like yeah. this, like, cross dissolve that There's hangs. quite a few of those frozen cross dissolves. Which, that one was uh, cool, though, because it's a map. Yeah. And it kind of looks like we're moving through yeah, it. Yeah, the, that was an the idea of that one is cool. I just mm-hmm. don't like freezing the cross dissolve. Yeah. You know what I mean? I, and, and they do it like three times in the episode, and I, I dislike it every time, especially the last one on Jeremy when it's frozen on the his one, face. Yeah, that one on Jeremy always reminds me of um, 28 Days Later. Mm. There's a shot of Killian Murphy in like a hospital bed. Yeah, that, that, that was weird to me. I mean, I feel like there's four or five different episodes where there's Sherlock's handwriting. Mm-hmm. I think they're like all different. Yeah. So it's hard to tell. I mean, we did have to kind of 
decide on one for the relics. Right. Which we found examples online of yeah. handwriting. But interesting to see. I mean, yeah. Can we talk about Edward Hardwick having to carry a child on his back and stumble through High Gable? Because every time I see that, I tense up because yeah. I feel like it took 10 years off his knees. Oh, well. I wonder how much acting was in that. Yeah. You know, and then the scene where you see him running at the end of the episode, mm -hmm. it looks like his knees hurt. Yeah. <laughs> he wasn't a spring chicken. I mean, it's a great moment. It's fun. It is great, but like they pull his arm out at one point. And yeah. It's like, <laughs> I just wonder how many takes they had, you know. I mean, that was, that's rough. Yeah. I do feel like Watson's probably greatest moment in the episode is the one where he remembers that he's seen Miss Burnett in the window. Because frankly, he doesn't, not only does he not have much to do in this episode, but he's kind of disparaged quite a bit by Holmes. You yeah. know, like, like, I suppose we have to consider you a man of letters, you know. There's just all these little things that he does that kind of disparage Watson. And, and actually, I don't know if you remember this, but when we talked to David Hansen, he said that Edward was actually kind of unhappy about that in this episode. Mm. He was kind of put off at how much he was getting dismissed. There's definitely a moment that I feel that Edward was getting dismissed. And that's when the three of them are talking at the end. So Freddie Jones is saying, we're getting back to our work and hopefully we don't, they don't get off. And then Watson says, you know, I think better of the law. Yeah. Freddie Jones just is looking and just turns away yeah. <laughs> and just turns to, to Holmes. Mm -hmm. But he just looks like he's just, never mind. I don't even want to listen to you talking anymore, but Watson's still looking at him. Well, and again, you know, we only know what David Hansen told us, but I, I, I just feel like there was a, a, some of that going on. And I think it's obvious too. I mean, Freddie Jones, when he rips the letter out of Scott Eccles' hand, yeah. like it's just kind of like, you're not important. Give me yeah. that. You know, there's a lot of that, a lot of dismissiveness going on. But but I do think this moment is pretty great because Watson's actually contributing something to the plot. He is, but now to go the other way with it, he just remembered that he saw someone crying her eyes out yeah. in the middle of the mystery of the thing that they're looking for, probably See, a woman in a house I hate locked to say up. It, I hate to say it, but it's like, I believe it. Because I feel like, you know, a guy <laughs> I mean, that age happened. and, and well, you know, all that stuff happening, all that like, stuff I can't happened, believe but, it. I know. I mean, it is a good performance, but it was yeah. like, when I see it, I just go, you just remembered seeing yeah. the person you're looking for? It's also like, it, there's a little bit of dismissiveness from Holmes in that moment, too, because he's like, I have seen her. Those awful Gorgons, you know, yeah. she is alive. I have seen her. And he's just like, sucking on his cigarette. You know what I mean? Like, he doesn't say anything. <laughs> well, because he's like, well, she, clearly she's in there. <laughs> yeah. I guess he's thinking about it. Yeah. Anyway. Um, I, I did have a question. This is an actual question, and maybe this is in that script book that you have. Mm. Why does Henderson insist on seeing Holmes and Watson? Because when they come in, Lucas says, you can't see him. Too bad. And then Henderson just says, yes. I will see them. Is it confidence? I mean, the script just basically says, you know, now we see Henderson clearly for the first time, a strong, active man with brooding eyes, a man used to giving orders and having them obeyed without question. He sits on a throne-like chair like an emperor. So I think it was just an excuse to show him, you know, an excuse to maybe to, to develop his character a little bit. I wonder if, like, story-wise, maybe he didn't want to appear weak by them going, he won't see you. Yeah. And he's like, no, I will see you because I'm a strong man. Could be. But then there's the, you know, there's the whole train uh, station scene. And if you freeze frame on Jeremy's face when he swings the stick at the glass as he's breaking it on the train. Yeah. And by the way, we, we learned from David Hansen that the way they achieved that was um, to shoot it in reverse. So they like move the train the opposite way. And, and he's holding and his he's stick just on holding it. the stick on the glass and he pulls it back. He pulls it back. Yeah, yeah. So it looks like it hit it. Old trick. But um, if you freeze the frame, Jeremy's face is so angry. It's almost frightening. Like, I don't think I've ever seen him in anything when he had that angry a look on his face. Yeah. But speaking of freeze framing, if you frame by frame that on the shot of the glass breaking, you can see the camera team mm. in the reflection. But what's cool is, it's only for like half a frame, but what's cool is they're wearing flat caps and period hats. Mm. So Good they touch. blend in, yeah. you know, pretty well. So it's it's, it's kind of cool they did it that way. Yeah. Um, Kika Markham is kind of throughout the whole episode and then but she doesn't really have any lines until just now yeah but i like the way they handled her character because she appears to be helpless just a helpless woman another helpless woman mm -hmm. you know for a majority of the episode but then she kind of springs to life and starts explaining the backstory yeah in basically the last 10 minutes of the show but you really see that she's the major component behind the scenes for, yeah exactly. for how all this stuff works out but i mean some pretty great scenes that all just come like right at the end you know the torture scene <laughs> yeah 
really effective, very cinematic lighting, mm-hmm. very cinematic framing. Mm-hmm. The music is amazing. You know, just these single dull drum sounds definitely creates like an interesting tense mood and then and the cross on the floor. But, you know, if we're going to look at those details, I feel like there, there's ones to pick out. I mean, I have what I guess you'd call a bad note. It's not terrible or anything, but there is a little discontinuity in the delivery of Miss Burnett's story <laughs> because she's emotional and she's sobbing, you yeah. know, and like, you left me behind, yeah. you know, and all this kind of stuff. And then it cuts to the flashback and she's like, I was on the train. And I, I know. Did this and I did. It's, it's like, it's, it's, it's like a different voiceover. day. And it's, but it's, it's more than just that. It's like, it's crammed in. I know, I it's, know. It's read very, very quickly. And I, I, I don't think she could have delivered it with emotion and and still got yeah. it in the time she had is the thing. I, I was really paying attention to that because I was listening to it in headphones and I thought I thought the same thing. I thought it was like in the scene where she's actually delivering to camera, she was allowed to do what right. she wanted to do. Right. And then they went, uh, we've cut some stuff. Now you've got to do all those lines, but you have half the time. Yeah. And it was just, well, yeah. I'm just going to have to read it. I, yeah, because it would have it would have sounded silly if she was like, and then we would try to follow him, and then... Yeah, you know, it would have been it very been, bizarre. It's, yeah. it's bizarre now, but yeah. it would have been way, way strange. Yeah. So, yeah, that, it, that was one of those things I felt like mm-hmm. you kind of just got to let it go. But I have another kind of random good note from the flashback, which is uh, when Mario's henchman, Lucas, is eating at the table and watching Miss Burnett. <laughs> and he's like eating like prawns or something yeah, and his something. lips are all wet. Yeah. And he even like dabs it with a napkin, but he misses all the liquid so his <laughs> lips are still wet. Yeah. <laughs> it's so creepy. Trader Faulkner, by the way, the name of that actor. He's another old school theater lifer. He's yeah. a, a really good actor. A lot of interesting choices. Let's just say, maybe I mean, most of them are good. Well, but he's, and again, he's hardly in it. But I remember things from him. I remember him, you know, like, who was it? Garcia. Yeah. Garcia. You know, <laughs> Garcia. <laughs> yeah. He's so creepy. That line, which you said in the show that it was added, the wives and son line, it's a really great addition. I mean, it just feels very evil, you mm-hmm. know, when he says, I am indestructible. It's It's just one of the most ominous moments in the series. Well, and honestly, too, like when he kills Garcia with like the stone in the sock or whatever. Yeah, it's brutal. It's brutal, but I like the fact that, and again, this is Doyle, I suppose, but it's, it's. I like the fact that Henderson is the one who kills him, you know, because he could have sent his henchmen to do it, but he goes out and does it, and it makes him just an even viler villain. Yeah. I don't know, I just but, I like But it. also confident. Yeah. Because he knew that the guy was coming to kill him. Yeah. And he's like, I'm going to go wait for him and I'll kill him. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but he doesn't know if there would have been three people or five people. Right. So he, it's just this weird amount of confidence and bravado. It's like, that does make him even more scary. Yeah. You know? He thinks he's indestructible. Yeah. And then that moment with the mirror where David Hansen said that Peter Hammond was caressing the mirror personally. Right. right. I feel like caressing the mirror could have been the title of his biography. <laughs> that's a good That's a good one. Somebody, somebody, somebody out there wants, wants to write to do that. that. Go for it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we're back at the train. And we see our two remaining Confederates cross pistols and get their revenge on the yeah, train. Yeah. I love this. It's a very classic image. It feels like Three Musketeers vibe right at the end. I would say maybe the only bad note I have is that the production sound of the door sliding open and clicking shut mm-hmm. seems like it would have spoiled the surprise a little bit. It's also, like a lot of things in this episode, slightly awkwardly handled because it's like you see one pistol fire yeah, and then you see two pistols cross and fire but only one fire oh does it yeah okay but i I wondered if it was meant to be like he fired and then he fired but yeah it would have been time timing wise (laughs) one one pistol there while i fire my pistol and then don't move while i shoot you right exactly yeah yeah this is kind of odd but it's artistic yeah it's artistic and it's one of those kind of classic movie things you know so i like it more than i think it's bad Mm -hmm. well let's talk about the books for a moment The original story was first published in The Strand in September of 1908 and in Collier's in August of 1908. This was the first story illustrated after the death of Sidney Paget. This one was done by an artist by the name of Arthur Twiddle, who would go on to do the Bruce Partington plans, but was never used again, much to Doyle's regret, according to the Oxford annotations. He actually liked him. I think these illustrations are great. I think they look uncannily like Paget's work, actually. I think the... Especially Sherlock. It is pretty uncanny. I, I do think the shot of the cook at the window is a bit much. Yeah. I mean, he looks like a monster. Yeah. Well, I mean, again, that's the racism of the time. That's the I racism think. of the time. And that's the description in in the book. Yeah. The description is like, frankly... Monstrous? 
Yeah. <laughs> Insane. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and it's a constable just, I completely lost my nerve, sir. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's just, you saw a guy at a window and you're a cop. But again, I think it's supposed to be like Tonga. I know, but it's just, it just seemed unnecessarily rough. Yeah. Another thing was Gregson is in this. Yeah. Inspector Gregson would have been in here because he shows up with Baines at Baker Street mm -hmm. rather than at Wisteria Lodge. Right. I think they couldn't afford to bring that guy back for one episode. <laughs> no, but, it, but it, I wouldn't have liked it. Yeah. Not, 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 not having him, but I just mean if, if it would have happened at Baker Street, it wouldn't have been. No, this was a good choice the way they restructured it to happen at yeah. Wisteria Lodge. I think that's great. Now, I know we don't like to talk about the dates, mm. but just quickly, at the beginning of this story, Watson states, I find it recorded in my notebook that it was a bleak and windy day towards the end of March in the year 1892. But in the empty house, we learn that Holmes went over the Reichenbach Falls in 1891 and didn't reappear until that story takes place in 1894. So if Holmes was dead from 1891 to 1894, how can this story take place in 1892? Yeah. <laughs> I, I think the answer is Doyle just pulled these dates out of his hat and gave it almost no thought. Right. Though, there is another connection here. In the Norwood Builder, which is supposedly set in 1894, the same year as The Empty House, that story starts, Our months of partnership had not been so uneventful as he had stated, for I find on looking over my notes that this period includes the case of the papers of ex-president Murillo and also the shocking affair of the Dutch steamship Friesland, which so nearly cost us both our lives. So yeah, something for the chronologists to try and sort out, but even though it makes no sense, it does sort of track with the Norwood Builder mention of ex-president Murillo. Mm. So maybe Doyle was like, well, I did want to mention that Murillo thing, so I'll keep it consistent with that. I'm not sure. I, I don't know. I think there's a quote from the show that kind of comes to mind when, when these things come up, which is from the solitary cyclist when Watson is investigating on his own. And he says, what have we gained by your expedition? He's like, the knowledge that the girl's story is true. I never doubted it. <laughs> Connection between the cyclist and the hall. Never doubted that either. That the hall is tenanted by Williamson. Who, who is, is the, the better, better for that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It doesn't make the episode better or worse. Right. Well, and, you know, we were talking about the cook. And as I said before, I like all this black magic voodoo stuff. Mm -hmm. If we ever remake this one, I'm keeping the shrunken monkey body. <laughs> I'm keeping the pail of chicken blood and the bones in the fire. I love those details. I thought they were just so great. I mean, I don't know if there's a way to do that these days where you don't Tastefully. offend somebody. Yeah. But, I mean, voodoo religion is not anything like it's ever been portrayed in movies. I mean, there's no such thing as a voodoo doll. You know what I mean? Like it, yeah. it, it, it's it's all just made up. But I think yeah, I think it's it's down to how it's treated, how it's handled. Because yeah. what's written in the story is, is pretty brutal. Is I mean, it talks about like he would have ripped a bird apart while it was alive. Yeah, it's like I don't know that we needed that piece, but yeah. it's it's interesting. It just seems like it's just adding to the otherness. Like we said, it's, it seems like it was meant to be divisive. But it's also a misdirection. And I think I think in mystery stories you need misdirection, and I think that's a great misdirection. You know, to like walk into a crime scene and see blood everywhere and it, chicken entrails, and you're like, okay, this is something bizarre. different, bizarre. Yeah. Like, and you'd you'd think you'd want to follow that, and and the fact that it ends up being nothing to do with that at all, I think that's brilliant. I think that's great. It reminded me of like Seven. Yeah, it's it's like if David Fincher would have directed this episode, right. it would have been in there, <laughs> right? But instead, it was Peter Hammond, and he's like, we don't need blood and guts everywhere. The only other little difference I have a note about is in the story, the note is sealed with purple wax, not scarlet, mm. which is in the original script. It was supposed to be purple. Oh, really? But they changed it to scarlet. Maybe they already had scarlet wax and they needed to pinch those pennies. This is something I was going to ask. I thought maybe it was too trivial. But I didn't research this before we sat down. But it does say it's a quarter sheet of paper. Mm -hmm. Maybe at that time, paper came in humongous sheets. <laughs> yeah. But it looks like a pretty big piece of paper. It, it looks does. like half a sheet of paper. Yeah. And it's also, he says, it was got two snips with nail clippers. I spent some time looking up nail scissors from yeah. the time to see, like, were there some, like, eight-inch inch nail clippers? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I don't think so. So I think that was a liberty they had to take so that they could get all that writing on there. And so you could see something on yeah. camera. But yeah. it just seemed, the amount of time they spent talking about the note, you would have wanted it right. Yeah. I mean, you, you, there are some longer nail scissors. I did find some. But he says two snips. Yeah. 
and they were curved. Yeah. And it's not curved. Yeah. <laughs> and it just seemed well, enormous. not to us, but I mean, we don't, we can't see it close up. So <laughs> maybe, maybe it was. Yeah. I don't know. That just seemed like maybe somebody made a prop and they went, yeah. Didn't do it right slight, at all. Slight, oh. slight missed opportunity. Yeah. Or it was just do it, do it that way so we can see it. It's, it's the 80s, man. We don't have HDTV yet. Exactly. Okay, well, are there any memorable good bits, bad bits, or Jeremy moments that we haven't already covered? A good bit. Towards the opening, when they're in the carriages, there's this simple but pretty effective, I thought, shot of some double doors opening, mm -hmm. one at a time. But you can't see anybody opening them. Right. <laughs> so it just kind of adds, again, to this oddness of this episode. Disjointedness. Yeah. yeah. I liked it, though. Yeah. One fun note, there's a little moment when they arrive on bicycle and they're looking at the house, yeah. POV, and the camera quickly pans to the bay windows and you see Watson's little finger pointing up in the foreground. <laughs> I don't know if I remember this. Yeah, it's it's right there. As, as they get to the window, you see his hand in the foreground. It's just kind of funny. Mm. Also a nice little flourish right there when they're on the bicycles chasing after Henderson on the way to the train. Just a nice little touch from Patrick Gowers. The music is... Yeah. You know, like the bicycle tire. Yeah. Nice. There's way. the moment where they get to Wisteria Lodge and Watson says, the gen this gentleman recommends the bowl where we stay overnight. Mm -hmm. And he says, um, I asked if he knew Garcia or his servants. And Jeremy's kind of subtle, dismissive tone when he says, did he? And then a dejected Watson just goes, no. To me, it's like, I feel like that didn't even need to be in the script. That's what I mean. It's just like, but it was something to have in the background so that somebody was talking while we were seeing I know, the but cuts then they, of the cook. But then it turned into Watson being kind of a dummy again. Mm -hmm. And Jeremy yeah. kind of going, what did you learn? It's funny. The line where Bain says, I thought I squeezed it dry, Mr. Holmes, but I see there was some left over after all. Like, I think about this quote a lot. <laughs> like, whenever I've think I've exhausted myself on a topic and someone brings something else up. <laughs> I, I think about that. Like it's always comes to mind, but it's just, it's, it's just a good line from the story, but it's also a good read from Freddie Jones. I it's, it's the only moment in the entire episode where Freddie Jones is not laughing. And then he manages <laughs> to get a laugh at the end of it anyway. He's yeah. like, squeezed it dry after all. And he's like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he's a little laugh at the end. Well, it's, it's, maybe that's the only time in the story where he thinks he got the better of him or yeah, something. Exactly. But, but yeah, it's a, I like it. I like it. It's just a tiny little moment with Jeremy that I love when he's with Henderson and he gets up and he slides his stick across the wooden floor mm -hmm. as he gets up from the chair. Yeah. Just great. I mean, it's like he knew that the audio of that would be nice. Yeah. So he did it that way. It's just, I like it. It's great. It's another tiny thing where Jeremy's at, they're at the hotel and he says, as you may have noticed, no tea for me. It's, yeah. it's just <laughs> yeah but it's like right at the beginning of the scene so it's it's like i don't know just, yeah. it's just nice placement of that i love it and i mean of course the final moment where uh where he's like but please inspector this is your case yeah and jeremy gives us that same look but i love this moment for a different reason which is as he delivers that line right before he takes a huge mm. drag off his cigarette and so he just has smoke pouring out of his nose and mouth for like 20 seconds straight <laughs> as he's giving these next few lines. And it's a, quite a few lines because Freddie Jones is in the mirror behind him. Yeah. And so, you know, it's a, he's just sitting there breathing smoke out for a while. And it's like, oh, my gosh, people. Well, the, the line where he says the most dangerous man of South, in South America, it's just. Yeah, and it's mm -hmm. a close up and it's just pouring out. Yeah. And you think it's all gone and then and then somebody else delivers a line and then Jeremy finishes the line there's still smoke coming out of him. Yeah. It's uh it's crazy. Well, I don't really have a ton of bad. I mean, but um one note, it's kind of hard to call it bad, but when Eccles is done telling his story on Baker Street and Holmes goes back into his room to change, mm -hmm. yeah. he tosses his jacket onto the mirror and he kind of misses Miss, uh... and it just falls onto the floor. Which seems, I mean, like it's either, you know, miss it altogether or land it, but but I, it's kind of hard to believe they wouldn't retake that. Well, I ran it back as well because I was like, that's very strange because he misses mm -hmm. and then he gets out a whole bunch of scarves. Yeah. And then he lays all the scarves up on the mirror mm -hmm. and then he puts his jacket on it mm -hmm. and then he puts a jacket on mm -hmm. and then he takes the jacket off the mirror. Yeah. <laughs> I wondered if he was thinking, we're going to redo this. Yeah, well, it could be. I mean, it's a neat scene because you see him basically getting dressed. My only bad note really isn't related to the episode. It's just uh, we kind of gloss over the fact that Baines knowingly detained someone illegally. Yeah. Because in his mind, the end justify the means. Mm -hmm. But in that same scene where they're discussing it, like right after that sentence, he says, 
we can't arrest Don Murillo without Miss Burnett's evidence. Yeah. It's just, it's just like, again, well, I it's think just it's like a racial a, thing. It's it, like, he's like, we can yeah. arrest that guy because he's not yeah. uh, British. He's not from here. <laughs> yeah. We can do whatever we want. Yeah. We'll use him as a pawn. Yeah. It's just weird that even in in this conversation, nobody in the room registers that. It's yeah. Just, well, it's a different time. Yeah. My only really other bad note is, uh, it's really kind of just a nitpick, but I did notice a number of instances in this one where there's debris in the gate of the camera. Yeah. Did you notice this? Like, there's at least three times where there's stuff stuck in the camera while mm. while it's rolling. Haven't noticed it in any episode up to this point, but a lot in this one. Yeah, I I kind of wondered on on some of those, and maybe it's not the case, but because of all the cross dissolves, we're actually seeing the kind of um, the older footage. Yeah. You know, it's it's the edited footage right. that, that's been lost apparently. Jeremy. Yeah. Yeah, let's talk about Jeremy moments. I mean, we've said so much. Uh, I, we're going to have the same ones, I'm sure. I mean, sure. <laughs> there's just so many looks that Jeremy gives Baines, or I guess he doesn't really give it to Baines. He gives the look to us or the camera. But, yeah. um, you know, when Baines puts the candy in his mouth, mm-hmm. I, it seriously feels like Jeremy Brett, and, and I mean Jeremy Brett, not Sherlock Holmes, yeah. is laughing at this little actor trick. Yeah. Like maybe Freddie Jones didn't tell him he was going to do it. And he just did it, and Jeremy went, are you kidding me right now? <laughs> well, it does look like he looks off camera. Yeah. Like, to the director. I mean, maybe it was supposed to be Watson, mm-hmm. but it definitely looks like he almost breaks character there and yeah. goes, are we seriously watching him eat candy, <laughs> pull it out of this bag? Yeah. And then he kind of looks at Freddie Jones and, like, raises his eyebrows, mm-hmm. like, are you for real? Yeah. But then he goes right back into character, yeah. and it's like, I like it because it's a Jeremy thing. Yeah. But it's pretty weird. It's and again, but I feel like this is probably the only episode where we get maybe three of those. You know yeah, what I mean? So I it's it's kind of it makes it fun. It makes it its own thing in that way, which is which. But is I, th- fun. I think it's because we're big fans. I yeah. think Michael Cox was probably right in his instinct <laughs> that it was too much. Yeah. And I mean, I could understand if people don't like it. Yeah. I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah. But it's just I happen to like both these guys, so I let it go. Yeah, for sure. All right. Well, it's time to throw some Persian slippers at this one. Yeah. What's it going to be, Luke? Well, I did think about this one. It's difficult to rate. Yeah. It's a weird one. You have to give it points for style, but I think you have to take points off for the fact that it's messy story-wise. I I think Freddie Jones adds back to the style points, Mm -hmm. but I think the fact that we don't understand the mystery by the end of it (laughs) takes more points off. Yeah. So it's kind of like all the cool stuff is, is just kind of evened out for me. So then it's just like, what do I think of it? And... When I think about it coming up in the series, it's like I put it a little bit above Silver Blaze, but definitely under my favorite ones. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if this is accurate to, to what I just said, but what, the number that was in my mind was 8.3. Hmm. Lower than you thought? Definitely lower than I thought, but I, I don't remember what you gave Silver Blaze. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. I just feel like I couldn't in good conscience give it a 9 because I'm thinking... It is so messy. It's so bizarre. You said you liked it more than Silver Blaze? Yeah. You gave Silver Blaze a nine. Did I? Yeah. <laughs> Silver Blaze? Yeah. Hmm. Well, I think because we had the conversation about, you know, what makes a great episode and is this one great? And I think your argument was it is great. It's just not your favorite. That's fair. So it fell So is this nine. one great? Is this one great? That's the biggest question. I mean, I, I'm struggling with all the same things you just listed. So I think for everybody listening, and I think I've said this before, as much as I think about these episodes, I don't really think about the score. Well, why don't you pause your you pause your <laughs> rating, and I'll tell you my thoughts. Okay. Because honestly, almost everything you just said is exactly what I was going to say. Yeah. I mean, I don't think you can just dismiss the fact that the episode's broken. Right. I mean, I, maybe some people can. Maybe some people never even noticed. I don't know. But like to me, it's just always been, you can't just leave the main mystery unsolved. Like, like <laughs> what, what is uh, Scott Eccles? Like, what he brings the mystery to them and no one ever addresses. I mean, all we get is that they get the bad guy in the end. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in theory, I mean, I don't, I don't know. Like, if I didn't know the story, would I understand all the pieces? And I, I kind of feel like maybe, but, it, but it's, you'd have to put some real work into it. Yeah. All that said, I think it's a really good show. It's entertaining. You know, it's lively. I, I think it's an example of Peter Hammond kind of starting to push boundaries, which, I think some folks might think it's too much Hammond. Like I said before, I think this is about the most Hammond I'd want in an he episode. Went ham. I don't ever think it goes into bad territory, though, stylistically. You know what I mean? I think it's on the edge because I think sometimes instead of being totally immersed in the story, 
you start to see the machinations of the director, which, you know, I'm on the fence about, but it's like w when you hire Peter Hammond, <laughs> that's what you get, you yeah. know? But I can sympathize with Michael Cox's opinions of Freddie Jones. I mean, I really like the guy, but I think it's hard to argue that it doesn't overshadow the episode. And frankly, our hero, Sherlock Holmes, mm -hmm. Which, you know, again, I just, I'm bouncing literally back and forth. Like, I don't mind because it's just one episode. Yeah, I don't mind if he's overshadowed. Yeah, but I think his performance, Freddie Jones, can be summed up at the end when he's playing with Holmes' little magnifying glass and he's laughing like a like a child with a toy. He, it feels like he was playing in somebody else's sandbox. Yeah. And maybe sometimes forgetting whose sandbox he was in. Mm -hmm. But what's an actor supposed to do? I mean, he was hired to be great. And he turned it up to 100, and mm -hmm. you can't fault the guy, you know? So, I don't know. All the performances are great. The camera work, the lighting is great. Everything about it's good. Like you said, it does feel disjointed. But I do like this one, and I, and I love Freddie Jones, so I, I am torn. But can it be considered great when the story is broken? I, I just don't know. I, I, I literally like you. I mean, I do think about these things. I thought about it all day. I was like, I don't know what to rate this episode. <laughs> Yeah. I feel like they're just getting harder and harder to rate. Yeah. Well, now we're going to have to find out if we're purely fanboys or if we can be objective. <laughs> well, that's just it. And But but even so, I mean, I was going to give it a, a much lower... I was going to give it very close to what you were going to give it. Mm. Uh, but I, I watched it again today. Just honestly, I didn't take any notes. I didn't pick up my phone. I didn't... I, I just watched it. And I was like, I've already watched it three or four times for this, but I'm going to watch it one more time and I'm just going to not think about it and try to enjoy it. And honestly, I enjoyed it. Yeah. Uh, you know, all the way through, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed all the little eccentricities of it. So is it in the nine category? I think I am just going to give it a nine, mm. a 9.0. <laughs> because I, 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 I don't know. I, I'm just not sure. It's, it's such a unique entry. You know, I'm glad we have it. So yeah. I, I just don't know. It's hard to say. Well, I guess I'd modify my statement a little bit. I mean, I, I don't think of our podcast so much as a service. I think of it as, as our opinion. Sure. And I, generally, my opinion on movies and things is different than other people's. Yeah. And I do like style. Mm -hmm. And I tend to, if I see something I like or if I see something I really don't like, I tend to go to IMDb and kind of see what the consensus is. Mm -hmm. And usually it's not what I was thinking. Sure. So I kind of sometimes think when, when we're doing these, I think about like if I was going to recommend this episode to someone, how hard would I recommend it? Yeah. And in that way, I think 8.3 is accurate. Right. Because I feel like if, if you wanted to tell somebody to watch this, you would go, it's cool. It's bizarre. It's a little disjointed. It's a little wonky here and there, but it's it's still interesting. Yeah. For That's me fun. personally, though, I do like all the Peter Hammond stuff and I like the Freddie Jones stuff and I like the Jeremy stuff. So... I mean, I guess with that in mind, I'd modify my score, but I don't think it's a nine. Yeah. I think, I want to say 8.6, yeah. but I think <laughs> just to be true to myself, then I guess I'd bump it up to 8.8. .8. What's funny is I was thinking about revising mine down to a, an 8.9. <laughs> <laughs> but again, it's like, I think about this episode, like I used to not really, I used to think of this as a lesser episode. Yeah. I kind of always did. I thought of it as a lesser episode. Only in these most recent viewings, and really appreciating Jeremy's little, frankly, Jeremy moments. They're not Sherlock yeah. Holmes moments. They're Jeremy, Jeremy looking at the camera moments. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Like Maybe it's just the fact that it's just something so different and unique to the series that we have these little moments of Jeremy playing to the camera in this way. I think we just have to accept that we like it. Yeah. Like, as I said, I don't think everybody's going to feel this way. Right. I think our Breton listeners mm -hmm. would agree with what we just said. Yeah. But, you know, I just watched um, The Last of Us, and the third episode really divided people. Mm -hmm. and, and I just think about, like, if there were people playing to camera in that episode, mm -hmm. or in any episode, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, because it was Jeremy, it works. And Freddie Jones kind of has that same feel to me. Not everybody. Not everybody can pull it off. Mm -hmm. Somehow they pull it off. Mm -hmm. And I don't mind it. It's a little cheeky, but I like it. All right. So final vote is 8.8. 8.8. And I might regret that. <laughs> I'm going to lock mine in at 8.9 <laughs> because now that I say it out loud, I, I do think having a broken story mm. should keep it out of the very top tier. Yeah. But I think it's great. I enjoy it. And I think 8.9 is a good, fair shake. That's fair. And I, I, I feel pretty good about these scores. I do. Yeah. 
Okay, well, let's ring the bell for a bit of Mrs. Hudson's housekeeping. Play the jingle. I feel like there's so much to get to today, but let's start with a quick update on the Sherlockian Relics Collection Volume 2. Luke? Yeah, well, they are shipping. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's that's the main news is they are shipping. I mean, we've kind of been off for a while, and we had a lot of pre-orders, and all, have all fulfilled now. All fulfilled, and yep. new orders come in and have gone out. And we're, we are still making them in batches to some extent, but we're kind of getting ahead of the curve finally, so it's it's good that they're going out. Mm -hmm. I did just want to take a moment to talk about the, the video that we put out, mm -hmm. just because I personally had a lot of fun doing that, like recreating shots from the show. Um, but I just want to talk just briefly about breaking uh, the bust. Oh, yeah, the one you broke in the video? Yeah, because there's one I broke in the video. But technically, I broke three. <laughs> One was just an um, early, early sample where I was kind of just seeing how the paint would lay on it and all that and everything. And I just thought, well, I'll just break it for fun. I took a hammer to it first mm -hmm. in the style of Beppo, and um, the head came off, but, like, it just <laughs> barely dented it. Really? And so I just started beating the crap out of it with a hammer. Yeah. Did nothing. So I put it in a bag like Beppo did, and I started smacking it on the ground, and it was chipping the concrete. So I got a cinder block out, <laughs> and I was breaking it against the cinder, and the cinder block broke. Wow. It's like, so these things are pretty robust. Well, I think the ones in the show are probably a little bit more hollow. They're very hollow. Yeah. You, you can see it it's to some, to, on some of them. But we are using HydroCal, which is a little stronger than Plaster Paris. Mm -hmm. I did make a few that were very, very thin. So I broke it, and I got the hunting crop. Found a hunting crop like Jeremy's, yeah. and I really smacked the crap out of it, and the hunting crop broke. <laughs> but it got a nice break, and it was... Um, yeah, it was worth doing. It was fun. It was kind of a cathartic thing, even though it was, you know, breaking stuff that took a long time to make. But sure. it was nice, and it was it was cool to be able to film that stuff. So it's on our website and on our Twitter. Yeah. And we should just say a big thank you to all the listeners out there who bought one of the sets, because without you guys basically funding our R&D, these things never would have been made. So I'm just glad that we were able to kind of experiment and get through it, and now we all get to have one to play with. Well, and we get a lot of emails, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, but um, we get a lot of emails, and a lot of people who have purchased the set have expressed their great happiness with it. And so, <laughs> I mean, we you know we, we knew it was going to be this way because we wanted these things for so long. We wanted this bus for so long, and now we have it, and, uh, you know, it's great. So, so happy that other people are enjoying it as well. Yeah, thanks for sticking with us. And I wanted to say real quick, we've had a few emails from new listeners, folks who have found us recently and have asked if we have any intention of reissuing volume one of the relics. Yeah. Uh, you know, since they missed it when it was available. Um, we're open to the idea if the demand is there. So, you know, but it's hard for us to do small runs of these things. So if there's others out there who are still interested in the first relics collection send us a note and let us know if the demand's there we're we're certainly open to it a couple of those pieces just they take time to create and, and it, it doesn't make sense to make one or two at a time it's right. like they, we need to make a bunch so it's just they are hand done so yeah we'll see what happens but yeah relics collection volume two is available now at our website and you can find links on our twitter and, and pretty much everywhere yeah okay well let's talk a little bit about bending the willow mm. the newly revised edition of david stewart davies now legendary book about Jeremy Brett and his time on the Granada series. So you'll likely recall that we had David on the show sometime back to talk about the book. And it was wonderful, you know, hearing his stories of his time with Jeremy and Edward and Michael Cox and June and the entire team. And if you haven't heard that podcast, I, I highly recommend it. What you might not know is that we actually recorded that podcast about a year previous mm -hmm. when Bending the Willow was scheduled to be released by an entirely different publisher, but that deal fell apart somehow and the book went back into limbo and so it was decided that we would sit on the interview until a new publisher was found and that finally happened back in September with the book scheduled for immediate release through Kaleidoscope Press. Now... In spite of the book being available for purchase, many, if not most, buyers never received their copies. Some did. We saw some photos of books in hand on our Twitter, but many, like Luke and I and our producer David, never received our copies, and uh, months passed, and many emails were sent to the powers that be, and still no books arrived. Then we started hearing from listeners wondering what was going on and asking if we had any insights, which... We attempted to obtain from the publisher, but frankly just got excuses about books being lost in international shipping or delayed because of staffing issues or issues with the British postal strike. And 
Other stories about the printers not delivering stock to them on time, so who knows what the reality was. Well, the goodwill and patience of the book-buying audience at large finally ran out last month, (laughs) with many folks filing for PayPal refunds and sending angry notes to the publisher and to David Stewart Davies and to us, and feeling that it was handled very unprofessionally, to say the least. We should say that we didn't have any involvement with this. We were just passing on the news. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, it's I understand, you know, we, we, we yeah. promoted it heavily. But, well, the folks at Kaleidoscope finally issued a statement of sorts attempting to explain the delays, but in an effort to make good on delivery, they made the book available on lulu.com, a print-on-demand website based in the U.S., which they said would be available for a few weeks as they filled all the back orders from the TV Brain website. And despite having open and unfulfilled orders for our own books, I decided to pick it up via Lulu so that we could discuss the situation and give a tiny review of the product, such as it is now that we have received a copy, which I have. Uh, I think the turnaround time for Lulu was about 10 days or so for those considering a purchase. But as you can see, Luke, I have the book in hand. Uh, alongside the original printing, uh, which is still fetching a decent price on the secondary market. But I have to say that customer service and delays to one side, I really love the new edition. It's a beautiful book filled with black and white photos, some of which are not included in the original edition. A nice forward to the new version by Davies. And while it's a smaller book than the original, probably three quarters of an inch shorter and one half an inch less wide, It is a much thicker book, coming in at 212 pages as opposed to the original 192. But it's not the pages, it's the paper. It's kind of hard to discuss because there's really no way to tell yet um, how this will compare with the printed copy that someday hopefully comes from Kaleidoscope. The paper might be totally different. The binding might be totally different. But for what we have in hand, it's a nice book. I mean, you can look at it. I haven't actually seen it. And, you know, paper stock and things aside, the layout of the book is actually... I think really top notch. The fonts are all different. The sizing and placement on the page is all different. But in my opinion, it's all an improvement over the original. I mean, don't get me wrong. I love the original book, but it has a very independent publishing feel to it. Uh, The use of fonts and formatting in the original is, I don't know, maybe a little dated, perhaps. The new copy feels very modern, very professional. I don't know. It might be a stylistic preference for some, but I think it looks absolutely fabulous in the new iteration. Which just makes me all the more sad that it has had such a troubled release. I mean, I really hope that the publisher slash distributor can get their act together and get this book into the hands of readers. I think every Jeremy Brett fan should have this on their shelf. But can we recommend that everyone go grab the lulu.com print-on-demand copy? Well, (laughs) if you're desperate. I mean, given the uncertain future of the book... If you don't have $1,000 to spend on the original, maybe. Yeah, well, that's just it. I mean, for those of us following this saga, I mean, I think if you want this book, you should go grab the Lulu version while you can. Um, I mean, we should mention the Kaleidoscope did state that it would only be on Lulu for a limited time while they worked out their shipping and printing issues. I hope it's still there by the time people hear this podcast. If it's not, hopefully that means it's all been sorted and normal ordering has resumed. If we get our hands on the non-Lulu version, we'll report back again. Um, I mean, I'm sure we'll report back either way because, well, we're owed a book or a refund. <laughs> so we'll see what happens. I, for one, am glad to have this new version. And congratulations to David Stewart Davies on his book being given new life, even if it uh, has been a somewhat troubled reintroduction. Definitely. Well, we have another huge announcement today, which is that our interactive Granada Sherlock Holmes shooting locations database is live. And uh, Luke, where do folks go to check that out and what what can they expect? Yes. So if you can go to our website, we will have a link on it, or you can go directly to locations.sherlockpodcast.com. This has been, frankly, a big effort by uh, one of our listeners, Steve, uh, who wrote in quite a while back, you might remember. Uh, Him and his team took the time to set up this page and create a ton of initial listings, followed by a, frankly, heroic effort by our producer, David, to find and input all the data and different images and kind of scouring the internet for more. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think we're over 100, maybe 150 locations at this point. So big thank you to David and as well as uh, Steve and Dan from Avast Tech for setting the page up. So to tell you what it actually is, when you go to the website, there will be a giant map on the right. 
And on the left, there is a list of locations, which you can switch between locations or episodes. So there's like an episode guide to tell you each location that we have so far. We're going to keep adding to it as we go. And we are working on enhancements to allow people to either um, upload their own photos or maybe they just get in contact with us and we can do it that way. But as we find new locations, we will add them. And there will be a, there's a map function with addresses so you can map to these things. But the, the, the coolest thing is just that it's actually interactive and you can scan around England and even yeah. as far as Malta and, and uh, Reichenbach Falls. But it's very visual. So you can see if you're, if you're traveling, if you're in England for the first time and you know where you're going to be. But um, it's neat to be able to go back because we, we uploaded all the photos that we took on our trips. Mm -hmm. And I actually went back to England one time without Gus. Yeah. And I went to Cornwall and visited a couple of locations and took some photos. And because I knew we were doing the website, I actually took the time beforehand to really find out where these places were. And I took some screen caps so that I could go and recreate as close as I could the shots from the show. So if you go to the website, you can look at locations like Lanyon Quoit, which is one of the standing stones that you see uh, Sherlock walk through. Mm -hmm. That's near Penzance, which is like basically as far west as you can go in all of England. So it's Unlikely most people will visit there, but I happened to be in Devon for my trip, so it wasn't too far. But I also visited Low Bar and Bar Lodge in Helston, Cornwall, which is the scene of what I call Needle Beach, where Sherlock buries the needle. Yeah. And um, Kynance Cove, which is the opening of the Devil's Foot. So there's some cool photos from those locations, but there's also a notes section, so we can tell you how to get there. Even if you have a map point, it's hard to know where to stand, to look at where you're at, right. to look at what you're seeing. And um, so this is where it comes in real handy because we can actually add those kind of notes. Mm -hmm. So definitely check that out. Really, really worth checking out. And it's very, it's searchable. If there's a location that you know of already, you can type it in, like Dunham Massey, or you can search by episode. And I mean, there's something in there basically from every episode. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's I wouldn't say it's complete, but it's pretty close to complete already. So I think it's close to 150 locations at this point. Yeah. And I know David was trying to add more, yeah. but it's it's thick. Yeah. And so, I mean, our hats are really off to David and Steve for everything they've put into that. And honestly, too, uh, quite a few listeners have already sent in some photos and, and those have been added to the database as well. Yeah, and we, uh, we will ask you to send us some photos. Um, we're working on enhancements to the website, so we, there may be functionality in the future to where users can upload their own photos. But there's still some things we got to work out behind the scenes before we announce that. Um, but if you are planning a trip, definitely check out the website. And if you're going to take pictures um, and you take screenshots or something, send them to us. We'll upload those and yeah. add them to the database. Yeah, so hopefully this will make life easier for folks out there who are looking to visit some of the Sherlock shooting locations and uh, get in touch. Definitely. Also, since we've been away, the winter edition of the Sherlock Holmes magazine was released, and our good friend Mr. David Burke, as Dr. Watson, made the cover. Yeah. Our boy. <laughs> um, which also includes an article that we provided for the magazine about our time with the man himself. Mm -hmm. um, there's an essay that Gus wrote with quotes from our interview and insights from our time with David and a bunch of photos from our trip. Some of them never even before seen. <laughs> yeah. Not to mention all the other content of the magazine, including an article with David Stewart Davies discussing Peter Cushing, some behind the scenes reporting on Enola Holmes 2, and lots more. So if you want to pick up a copy before it sells out, visit sherlockholmesmag.co.uk and get yours today. Fantastic. Also, just a quick announcement to let people know that Young Sherlock Holmes, the 1985 Barry Levinson, Steven Spielberg produced film, has finally arrived on Blu-ray just a few days ago, in fact, and I watched it and it has never looked or sounded better. I fell in love with the movie all over again. I should say that from a strictly technical point of view, the video transfer is not perfect. Yeah, It's not up to the top standards of today's big budget releases, but it's a vast improvement over any previous DVD release of the film. Uh, the sound actually blew me away. I've never noticed such a drastic improvement in audio from mm. one generation to another. Uh, the music sounds great. So, I mean, I will say there are zero bonus features on the disc, which was a fairly big disappointment for me uh, and probably will be for a lot of film fans. But if you're a fan, I think you'll enjoy seeing this film fresh. And if you've never seen it, this is the version to watch. Definitely. Well, and finally, in movie news, our movie, The Vast Lonesome, is at long last underway. 
Uh, we're excited to announce that we are beginning production work on it this month, and we wouldn't be able to do that without the support of some incredible, incredible listeners who have come on board as either donors or investors. So just one more thank you to our good friends, Joey, Tom, Rick, Derek, Rob, Kat, Andrea, Randy, Monica, Keith, Deb, and Vinod. We'll be sending you all a private update very soon with some fun perks to follow our progress and even maybe get you guys involved. We are still on the lookout for a few more partners to help us with post-production expenses, so there's still a chance to get involved. And if you'd like to know more, drop us a line at contact at sherlockpodcast.com, and we're happy to send you some info on the project. Or you can just visit vastlonesome.com to learn more. This is a huge deal for Luke and I, and I I know we've said this before, but this movie is a sincere passion project for us, and we can't wait for you guys to see it. Yeah, we really can't thank you guys enough. This is huge. Yeah. Okay, well, let's open it up to a few listener telegrams. Okay, well, this isn't really a telegram, but I wanted to address something from the last episode, Silver Blaze. We mentioned that, or I mentioned that, I was a bit disappointed in the fact that we could see beyond the edges of the Baker Street set (laughs) at the start of the episode when the camera shoots up into the rafters. Yeah. I said it was pretty unforgivable, and as you mentioned, you wondered if that might be unique to these new HD transfers and if maybe the original broadcast might have been framed differently. Mm. Well, I went back and I watched an old capture on YouTube, which I think was from the DVD set, And I can confirm that you were correct, that the top of the set piece was not visible Mm. in that older transfer. So I'm not exactly sure what to think of this development. I mean, I guess the transfers done for the Blu-rays perhaps had some flexibility with the frame and just opened it up a bit too much. I mean, I really don't know. Yeah, it's hard to say. I mean, the aspect ratio in the show changes every now and then. Yeah. We don't don't really even comment on, on all that often, but it does change from strict 4.3 to, to slightly different yeah. aspect ratio. So that could account for some of it. Especially on the later ones. But I don't know. We've had some conversations lately with Granada crew members who assured us that the show was shot safely for the most part, meaning that if we ever could find the original elements, that we might be able to get a widescreen version of the show. Though everyone more or less agrees that those elements don't exist anymore. Mm. So, I mean, apparently it was shot safe most of the time. Though this example... I don't know. I'm just not sure what to make of it. But to, just in case anyone out there was looking at their copy or of the at the YouTube version and wondering what the heck we were on about, yeah. um, the two versions are different in that way. Okay, our first telegram comes from a wonderful friend of the show, Debbie. Hey, Debbie. And Debbie writes, First, let me shout out a very loud yay for the second batch of relics. Love it. Thanks for all of your hard work in putting the package together. Well, thank you, Debbie. Secondly, as your fan who rides and owns horses, Silver Blaze was, of course, a favorite of mine. What better than a Sherlock Holmes mystery plus a horse? (laughs) Several things I noted with an equine perspective. First, having two valuable racehorses, Colonel Ross has them living in absolute squalor. (laughs) The two standing stalls for Bayard and Silver Blaze looked ancient as well as filthy and unworthy of valuable racehorses, to compare, the Lipizzaners of the Spanish Riding School in Vienna lived in 12 by 12 foot box stalls even in the 1800s. Hmm. Next up, the horseshoe print. When a horse walks, they leave four hoof prints since they have four legs. Even if the horse was galloping, there would have been more than one hoof print visible. I've never seen a horse pass by and leave only one random hoof print. <laughs> I'll pause there. Yeah, I mean, I thought about this, too. I mean, there really should have been a ton of hoof marks on the ground. I mean, but I suppose it's one of those plot things, you know, like if the trail were easy to follow, then Sherlock Holmes wouldn't have looked so stupendous when he yeah. uncovered it. So maybe there was just one part of the ground that was really soft. Yeah, that's all, that's all we they stepped on. Could be. Maybe the horse was sneaky and was trying to hide his hoof prints. Well, Silver Blaze was a sneaky guy. <laughs> anyway, back to Debbie's note. I don't know if you noticed, but for a brief moment, the contents of the bucket being carried by the groom is shown, and it didn't contain water or the sponge. It looked like paper towels. Okay, I did not notice this, and I had to go back and check it, and yeah, great eye. I think they thought the shot was wide enough that no one would notice, but what makes it funny is that Ned even kind of tilts the bucket to camera, and you can see that it's totally empty. Mm. So, nice catch, Debbie. 
They, we, we do have to say that, like, this is from a time. I mean, going back to the comment earlier about, mm -hmm. about the, the set extensions. Yeah. I mean, this is from a time where I think people did assume you're not going to see this. You, you, you can't make this out. Yeah. Okay, well, back to the note. Debbie writes, Horses cannot see directly in front of their face. It's a blind spot due to their eyes being on the sides of their head. So they are wary when anything comes near this zone. Most horses do not like water anywhere near their face, and of course trying to wash it off from the side of his head would be less dramatic, but it would have been less frightening to the horse. I used to own an OTTB, or off-the-track thoroughbred, who was hosed down head to tail every day after workouts for years, and never got over his fear of getting water on his face. Of course, Jeremy knew this fearful behavior since he grew up with horses, and yes, the horse is a gregarious creature. When Holmes opens the stall door, he does his dramatic squeezing of the sponge and attempts to wipe the horse's face, but then it cuts to Colonel Ross reacting and then cuts back to Holmes, where he has clearly squeezed the sponge just enough to be damp as not to freak out the horse and talks to the horse to soothe him. This is all Jeremy. The guy inside the stall is there to make sure the horse stayed on his mark and didn't try to back up. Mm. And she closes by saying, I love watching Jeremy in any two-shot with a horse. His love for horses shines in these moments, and he even delivers his lines with a gentleness and affection that I don't think Sherlock Holmes would have done. That gentleness is all Jeremy. Thank you so much for all of your hard work on the podcasts and the relics. Love it. Cheers, Deb. Well, thank you so much, Deb. And uh, fantastic observations from an equestrian perspective. All of that seems right on the mark to me, Luke. I don't know. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I think we kind of alluded to something similar in the episode uh, where Conan Doyle said he wasn't an expert on these things, but he wanted to include them as from an artistic point of view. So I think someone like Deb would see these things and understand exactly why they happened or maybe why they didn't do certain things a certain way. Right. Um, but for the general public, it goes by just fine. Yeah. But, but it's good to have clarification. Yeah, of course. No, that's great. Toady UK on YouTube left us the following comment. I thought it was worth reading. Uh, he says, In the UK, ITV have recently released a streaming service, ITVX, which has all of the Jeremy Brett Sherlock Holmes episodes for free to stream. This may also work internationally with the use of a VPN as well. I hope this isn't old news to you, but for fans like me, it's a great way to access the episodes again. Yeah, thanks, Toady. Uh, we didn't know about this. That's great to know. Maybe if we get a free minute, we can try to access it here with a VPN. I'd be interested to, to know if that works. I do think you need a VPN, but I think there is a way to do it. But it just depends on how much time you want to put into it. Mm -hmm. But to that same point, Brian Weaver on Twitter wrote to us and said they are being shown on ITV4, but also on the ITV website at itv.com forward slash watch forward slash Sherlock. Okay. Uh, this was as recent as January 12th. Okay, cool. Well, there's some options there for people, and who knows, they might both require a VPN, but... Yeah, I think for ITV, they, it might, but you might at least have a few options. Yeah. Another comment here from YouTube left by the Tyrant King of Flowers. He agrees that the, the real reason is almost certainly that there was no direction for the background actors, and that's why they all kind of just stand around. But he says, if we want to play the game, which we do, of course... I think a somewhat plausible in-canon reason would be that maybe in the late 1800s in Dartmoor, the folks wouldn't be used to seeing a world-famous detective or celebrity like Holmes, so they're transfixed on his figure. <laughs> possible. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a fine point, and, and I don't know, maybe that will help me enjoy that moment a little bit more <laughs> in future viewings. Definitely possible, yeah. Yeah. Very good friend of the show, Tom, wrote in to say, Hey guys, I could be wrong, but I think the china pattern that appears in the panel dining room of Colonel Ross when he's giving dinner to Holmes and Watson at the end of Silver Blaze is one that I own. Mm. This is china by Harend, a Hungarian manufacturer. The pattern is Chinese bouquet in green. First designed in 1930, it comes in many colors as well as multicolored versions and is still being made. It is very expensive, but good used pieces can be bought more cheaply through Replacements Limited which is how I picked up some pieces of my own. The date would make this china pattern anachronistic for the 1890s, but it looks old, and I have spotted it in many British period dramas. Signed, Tom. Thanks, Tom. I did check this, and it certainly does appear to be a match. I really wonder if the props department brought these in, or if they came with the house, so to speak, you know, if they're already on the location. Again, great catch. If anyone out there is in the market for some truly nice dishware, 
I looked it up, and these run about 200 per piece. Wow. So you can get a small set for a few grand. But as Tom said, there might be some deals out there if you... Uh, Look hard enough. Yeah, and if you want to be surrounded by that kind of Victorian luxury, this would be the way to go. Nice. Our next telegram comes from a listener by the name of Ronnie, who writes, Dear Gus and Luke, when I listen to your podcast, I feel like I'm a member of a select secret society of people who realize how very special Jeremy Brett was in this role. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ronnie, and welcome to the club. <laughs> you are in the club. That's right. I'm writing specifically about the telegrams from the Silver Blaze episode in which Peter wrote about the music that Holmes was humming. When you play Liebestod from Tristan and Isolde, I recognized it as the one being used in the Red Circle, that is the very song that is being sung when Holmes and Watson take Leverton to the opera at the end of the episode. It's so very wonderful to see how hard everyone involved in the Granada series worked to maintain the overall integrity of the characters and their world. Regards, Ronnie. Fantastic observation, Ronnie. Thanks for writing. Yeah, um, as Luke mentioned in the, in the last episode, if we were more cultured, we probably would have <laughs> caught that too. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it's a great note. Someday we'll be cultured. We're getting there. The next telegram is from Nick, and he writes... Hi, both. I am a Jeremy Brett Sherlock Holmes fan living in Yorkshire, England, near a town called Keithley. You may be aware of the Keithley and Worth Valley Railway, which runs from Keithley to Oxenhope, via Haworth, home of the Brontes. And I'm sure you're aware of the Oakworth Railway Station, where scenes from The Final Problem and Wisteria Lodge were filmed. Anyway, my 11-year-old daughter was recently at Ingro Railway Station, and knowing I was a Holmes fan, she took the attached photos of a certain train carriage that was parked there. And he provides a few photos, and it's it's the very same train car that Miss Burnett jumps from in Wisteria Lodge. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, and he provides a link with a bunch of historical information about the car, which we'll share. But it's it's funny because the first thing on the website says, available for filming use. Um, and it goes on to mention it was used in a bunch of shows and films, including Danger Man, which I'm currently watching, and the Bruce Partington plans. So we get to watch for that train car in the very next episode. Hmm, very nice. Anyway, Nick goes on. Perhaps not as grand or glamorous as some of the other locations, but I'm sure you'll agree this will still be of interest to fans of Jeremy Brett and the Granada series. All the best, Nick. Yeah, thanks so much, Nick. Wonderful info. Yeah, we'll definitely share those links so people can learn more about the history of this awesome train car. Uh, I hope you have a reason to film in a period train car someday. I'd love to use the one from the show. That would be incredible. We'll also get it up on the location website as soon as we can. Yeah, that'd be great. The next telegram comes from Tim. Tim writes, Hi, guys. Last weekend, I bought a $5 Xbox game, Sherlock Holmes, Crime and Punishment, and was amazed when I started playing it to find it was based on the Granada production. They don't get Jeremy Brett 100% right, especially the voice, but the CGI and voice for David Burke's Watson is excellent. I've only just started playing it and have done the first case, which is The Adventure of Black Peter. Anyway, I just thought maybe other Granada Sherlock Holmes fans who enjoy gaming might be interested in this. Thanks again for the great podcast, Tim. Thanks, Tim. You know, I don't play very many games at all. In fact, I think we recently got an Xbox, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. our original Xbox. <laughs> yeah. But we bought that game, and I don't know if I've ever even put it in. Oh, yeah. No, I probably should. Well, I got that game back in the day, too, back when I had way more time for games. I think it was free on Xbox Live at the time. Anyway, mm. I was also really taken with it. I think I might have sent you a screenshot at the time. This was like five years ago. But I was I was taken at how they tried to copy the Granada aesthetic, yeah, kind of without actually infringing on the copyright. But like it, it's close, but not exact. But it was obvious to me that they were very much inspired by the show, which I was glad to see. I tried to play the game, but it's one of those you know it's, it's a low action type game where mm. the controls aren't really very polished, kind of on the clunky side when you compare it to a AAA game. I, I was just never able to get into it. I just I didn't really have the time, but. Um, I still have it on my Xbox, and again, perhaps someday if I break both my legs, I'll have an excuse to play it through finally. I could break both your legs. <laughs> but uh, thanks, Tim. I remember way back in the day, I think it was called Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective Volume 2. It was a video game called that. Mm. There was a character called Agram Fami, and his name was an anagram for something. And I can't remember the anagram. I just remember the name Agram Fami. Fun time. <laughs> The next missive is from a good friend of the show, Richard. He writes, Gentlemen, regarding the intersection of the original Doctor Who programs and Sherlock Holmes, I can tell you with authority that there was, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, circa 1986, a rumor swirling around that the sixth Doctor was going to be replaced by none other than Jeremy Brett. 
Mm. It circulated pretty narrowly, but there was that overlap of the fan base. Wow, yeah, that I mean, that would have been something. <laughs> yeah. That probably would have got us watching. <laughs> yeah, I know, exactly. <laughs> but Richard continues, Secondly, from time to time, listener telegrams draw attention to other favorite portrayals in movies and television as well as audiobooks. I think the 1950s series with Ronald Howard has been mentioned. If not, they're fun, if silly, and easily available on YouTube. I'm pretty sure the radio programs starring John Gielgud as Holmes and Ralph Richardson as Watson, early 50s, I believe, have not been mentioned. There aren't an awful lot of them, perhaps a dozen or so, but I loved listening to those as a little kid and was thrilled to discover some, maybe all, are also available on YouTube. If you don't know them, they're worth a listen. As ever, thank you for the podcast. All the best, Richard. Well, thanks, Richard. My God, there are so many Sherlock Holmes in the world. Yes. I don't know how we'll ever find the time to devour them all, but, I mean, these sound fantastic, especially the Gielgud ones. So, yeah, I mean, I'll look forward to finding the time to check those out, perhaps in my declining years. Speaking of different adaptations, I, I went back and I watched a couple of the Basil Rathbone uh, adaptations. Yeah. Uh, honestly, can't remember the name of them right now. The Scarlet Claw? <laughs> Not that one. The one on the train? Okay. I can't remember the name of it, but yeah. it was rough in my opinion but that took me to another basil rathbone movie which was this is maybe one of the greatest titles of all time the ghost in the invisible bikini oh of course yeah that is speaking of adaptations this was like to me this was 1966 had boris karloff basil rathbone i think this is as close to like a a live action (laughs) scooby-doo as could ever be possible yeah but if you need something really funky and campy to watch and Basil Rathbone shows up, yeah, it, it'll, you know, it'll occupy your time. I have watched all the Basil Rathbone films. I have them on Blu-ray. I have the set. And it's a good set. I'm not going to lie. I mean, again, I'm like you. I, I He's not my Sherlock Holmes. Um, frankly, I'd rather watch Peter Cushing than Basil Rathbone. I do like Basil Rathbone as an actor. He's in a lot of great movies that I really like. Yeah. Um, I just don't love the Sherlock Holmes ones. I don't. I don't know why. I just I have and a then, hard time getting into most them. Most of them aren't canon. Yeah. And I think I think that's just it. It's just yeah. They're just too loose. I'm gonna drop a name right now. Let's do it. So, um, we were once at Johnny Depp's house. Oh gosh. <laughs> And he had, well, he was a big fan of Christopher Lee. He was a friend of Christopher Lee and mm-hmm. Peter Cushing. And he had them on his desk. He had the Basil Rathbone films on his desk. And I tried to, we, we tried to convince him to give Jeremy Brett a try. And he and he was just like, oh, no, no it's Basil Rathbone. <laughs> it's Basil Rathbone. Yeah, it was yeah. Basil Rathbone for him. He didn't, uh, he didn't want to give Jeremy a try. One of these days, we're going to be with him again, and we're going to make him watch The Solitary <laughs> Cyclist. That's my goal. Yeah. Okay. Our final telegram for the night comes from a listener by the name of Eric, and Eric takes us back to the resident patient with the following. He writes, Dear Gus and Luke, I have something to share that I'm hoping you might both consider. It concerns the resident patient and my take on the scene where Holmes throws his arms around Sutton slash Blessington's body in preparation for taking him down from the chandelier hook. I will admit that I waited a bit impatiently to hear the two of you address this scene, as I've always found it a sublimely moving moment one of the most important Jeremy Brett moments in the series, as a matter of fact, and though your insights are often similar to mine, I found in this case that I saw something different, extraordinary, and so beautifully and wholly Jeremy Brett. Here's what I see and why this scene moves me so deeply. In such a horrible situation, there's little room for dignity for the victim. The investigators must either gather their evidence, and a dead body inevitably becomes nothing more than an object. But in this specific moment, Holmes, in spite of his usual emotional distancing and hyper-focus on the intricacies of the crime at hand, demonstrates the most heartbreakingly powerful tenderness when he suddenly disengages his analytical mind and embraces Blessington as a person. He steps up to the task and holds the body with no fear or disgust, closely and tightly as Blessington is lowered. He is the one who brings Blessington back to being a human being. In Jeremy's remarkable eyes and face, and in only a few brief but therefore terribly exquisite moments, I see everything from A, a flicker of guilt that he hadn't been able to stop the murder in spite of a warped form of justice having been served, B, genuine empathy for the poor old tragic enormous Blessington, and C, a beautiful, delicate sadness at the absurdity of it all, not just the investigative process, but the exhausting, never-ending cruelty of human beings all of which make his commitment to treating the body as a human immediately after its investigation as just a corpse and to give Blessington the dignity he deserves, criminal or not, especially poignant to me. I was rereading the story recently 
as well as the Priory School for whatever reason, and found the word reverently in both, in reference to Holmes handling a body. It seems to me that this reverence is something Jeremy would have picked up on, and with the kind of man he clearly was, it would have meant a great deal to him to convey this aspect of Holmes, if only through the inimitable emotive power of his face. Of course, maybe this is all my brain misfiring, projecting emotion where none exists, or seeing Jeremy and not Sherlock, but regardless, I wonder if the two of you will agree with me upon viewing this scene again. Take care, and thanks again on so many levels. Warm regards from Canada, Eric. P.S. I cried when I heard David Burke's voice. What an experience for the two of you, and for your listeners, and what a magnificent, hilarious, and brilliant man he is, not to mention Anna, who is fantastic in her own right. Well, thank you, Eric. That's a wonderful observation. I think we all cried a little bit when we met him. <laughs> well, that for sure. Regarding Blessington, I think we may never know what Jeremy was thinking in those moments. I mean, I've always felt that he delivers so much in that scene with Blessington. I mean, there's clearly a great deal going through his mind just then. I, I remarked on that, I think, in mm. that episode. Exactly what is he thinking? It's hard to say, but everything you said in your note makes total sense. And I, I absolutely, I, I think it adds to the interpretation of the scene. I don't know. What, what do you think, Luke? I think that's exactly right. I think what a great artist like Jeremy Brett would do is give you enough to where you could interpret it the way you want to see it. Mm -hmm. Also, the word reverence is extremely poignant here because the other time we see a dead body is in the Six Napoleons. Mm -hmm. And Holmes treats that body with reverence as well. You know, he, he's really staring into, he's really considering the concept of death and what it means to, to a human. And I think, yeah, I think you could see that in Jeremy's face mm -hmm. with Blessington. Maybe you see a lot of other stuff too. So I think, I think, yeah. And I think that's what's, like you said, so great about these shows. I mean, how one can see them so many times and constantly find new things to appreciate or interpret over the years. It's, I mean, it's why we keep talking about them and will for a long, long time. Definitely. Thanks, Luke. And a special thanks to Kika Markham and David Hansen for sharing their stories. As always, please do find us on YouTube, on Facebook, and on the web at twitter.com slash sherlockpod. And please send any thoughts and feedback to contact at sherlockpodcast.com. Your iTunes reviews also help us immensely, so thank you for those. And of course, a very special thanks to our Patreon supporters. On our Patreon, you'll find our archive of extended interviews, deleted scenes, and more. And we recently added some very in-depth videos about the creation of our Napoleon busts. So if you've ever been curious about the plaster work and the mold making that went into creating such a prop, check that one out. You can find us at patreon.com slash Sherlock podcast. The next story is another great one. I hope you'll join us as we examine the Bruce Partington plans. Until then. <laughs> <laughs>